Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining. We're going to be uh, starting in a few minutes, but we're uh, pleased to see uh, so many people jumping on early. So thank you for coming. We'll be getting underway at 9. Good morning, everybody. My name is Toby Fife. I'm the uh, president of the Institute on Governance, and I want to welcome you right on time to our Digital Directions event and start by giving thanks to all the IOG team that has made this possible. Let me take a moment, if I could, to tell you a bit about the IOG. We're a not-for-profit charity. We have offices in Ottawa, Toronto, and Baghdad. We've been around for 30 years and we're driven by a fundamental belief in the importance of government. We believe that good government and its democratic institutions cannot be taken for granted, but have to be nourished and supported in an increasingly challenging environment. And we contribute through public sector leadership development, board governance and advisory work, both in Canada and internationally. And as you will have seen by the lead up to this session, and as you will see as we follow it, we believe that learning involves not just presentation, but also engagement, research, and collaboration. Before I go further, I wish to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional lands of Indigenous peoples, and reinforced by the horrific discovery in Kamloops, that we all have a responsibility to make reconciliation and healing real and meaningful. In Ottawa, where I'm based, we acknowledge the land we stand on is unceded territory of the Algonquin Ashnabi people. They are the traditional guardians of this land, and we acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory. Now, some housekeeping before we start. If we were in our offices at 60 George Street in the Byward Market, this would be actually very short and very easy. I'd merely be telling you the washrooms are down the corridor. But we're in an online world. And believe it or not, there are over 200 of you registered for this. And so we're taking full advantage of the technical opportunities of before us so that you can participate and engage. So uh, give me a minute or two to run through the how this will work and give you some of the technical options that are going to be before you. First of all, you can watch the entire day on Zoom and most of it on YouTube. We have two group discussions booked, one at 11.45 and another at 1.30 this afternoon, and they won't be live streamed to YouTube because of the breakout format. Our technical guru, Becky Hollett, will share the link to our YouTube channel in the Zoom and Slack chats now. Now, if you wanna participate in the breakouts but can't join in Zoom, you can join our moderated Slack workspace, and we'll share that link in Zoom and YouTube now. You'll notice, those of you who are in the Zoom room, that we've disabled your cameras and microphones. This is to protect the session from malicious content and Zoom bombing. You will only be able to use your camera and microphone during the breakout activities. But look, we're here for a full day and we want to engage you in the full day. So we're using a program called Slido that allows word clouds, polling, and question crowdsourcing. And all of you, whether you're participating in Zoom, YouTube, or Slack, can use it. We're now going to share that link in the three chat areas. I'd recommend you keep the page open all day and use it to ask questions, to support other questions, 
and to vote in polling. And by the way, you'll also find that link in the emails we sent you leading up to today. And we'll share it every time we invite you specifically to vote in a polling process. We have two dedicated Zoom and Slack moderators for you today, Catherine Waters and Tara Mirza. They'll be available to help you with any questions and comments, so just put those in the chat for them to respond to. Now, of course, if you have questions for the speakers, you can ask via Slack, Zoom, or YouTube chat, and the moderators will make sure to add them to Slido if you're having difficulty in that area. So there's your technical explanation of how we're planning to use the day. So what's our purpose today? Well, as we've told you in the materials, it's to begin designing what we're calling a blueprint for an inclusive, digitally enabled government. And today's event and the research and engagement processes that will follow is part of an IOG project called Can Gov Better, an IOG initiative aimed at ensuring a strong, responsive, and relevant public sector that can meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. That, in my view, is why the IOG is here and critical to our purpose for existing. What about the content today? Well, we're going to start by exploring two of what I believe are the most important issues facing digitally enabled government. So this morning, we're going to focus, if you like, on the policy front, looking at the challenge of increasing social media disinformation on trust in government's ability to address key policy challenges. And this afternoon on the management front, we're going to be rethinking traditional ways of working and delivering services for a smart and inclusive digital government. We're going to hear from and interact with international experts from the EU and the US, Canadian specialists and academics, and this afternoon, the Honorable Joyce Murray, Minister of Digital Government. Mid-morning, we'll be offering you a sneak preview of an IOG research project looking at the impact of extreme social media on Canadians' trust in government's ability to address specific key policy issues like climate change, immigration, and Western alienation. So, I've talked far too long. I hope you enjoy the day. Feel free to tune in and out on these specific areas that interest you. And I really look forward to your participation both today and as we follow up afterward. So let me now hand it over to our Senior VP of Governance at the Institute on Governance, Stephen Van Dyne, who's going to lead us into the first session of the morning. Stephen. Thank you very much, Toby, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to have the opportunity to introduce to you uh, Thomas Grandjouin from the uh, from the Disinformation Lab in Brussels. Um, Thomas is going to talk to us today uh, about a, a key issue that is affecting all governments, uh, democratic, across the, the planet, and. He will also give us a sense of what they do at the Disinformation Lab in Europe. This is, Toma, I believe, your first opportunity to speak to a Canadian audience uh, of uh, senior public sector leaders and, and, and others. And so I am quite pleased to, uh, to, to be part of your debut to, uh, to Canada, and hopefully we'll see more of you. Uh, in terms of logistics, um, I would just like to say that, uh, to build on uh, Toby's remarks, that we will be having the opportunity to take some questions uh, during uh, Toma's remarks. You can add your comments and questions directly in the Zoom, YouTube, and Slack chats. And I will be moderating the discussion through our Slido page, which we will paste for you in the charts now, in the chats now, rather. Uh, feel free to keep this page open and click on the Q&A section. And here you can update questions and you'd like to hear and add your questions directly to the queue to our moderators. I will, without further ado, uh, invite you, Toma, to talk to us today about uh, disinformation, detecting and responding to the threat that's facing governments around the world. Thank you, Tom. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. And are you able to hear me and see me okay? I'm patching in from, from Brussels. Um, so I will, if that's okay with you, share my presentation. There we go. 
Wonderful. So you should be able to see my presentation now. And I trust that everything is okay because wonderful. So uh, hello, everyone. Bonjour. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, joining you today. Um, I want to uh, speak about uh, a number of different things uh, today. We're going to touch on different I sort of dimensions of the uh, of the disinformation threat, and um, the sort of the presentation that I we will look at today uh, has really sort of three components: um, detection, assessment, and uh, response. So, uh, just very quickly uh, to introduce uh, myself, uh, I lead the the advocacy activities uh, at the EU Disinfo Lab. We are Europe's leading uh, independent NGO, specialised in researching understanding and exposing uh, disinformation. And in the context of your discussions on how to improve uh, public trust uh, in Canada, uh, we want to, to share a couple of the learnings that um, we've found uh, from both the regulatory discussion in the EU, because the European Union is breaking new ground in how to regulate uh, this problem, and also to share, uh, I think more in this presentation, some of the uh, ins and outs of, of disinformation as a societal and a technological uh, problem. So um, first of all, uh, in terms of uh, my presentation will be divided into three parts. Uh, so first we'll look a little bit about the threats and I'd like to talk a bit about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, what we call the infodemic. And then we will look at a very specific case uh, of an information operation uh, so that you have an idea of what uh, a specific, sophisticated example of disinformation uh, looks like. Uh, second, um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the assessment of this problem and, and where, where we have a problem, where it's going wrong in understanding, um, uh, in, in countering the disinformation threats uh, at a regulatory and at a corporate level within the companies. And then thirdly, how do we respond to it? Uh, how do policymakers, um, how can policymakers craft a response uh, to this issue. Uh, again, coming from a European uh, context, but hopefully analysis that can be brought over into a Canadian uh, context. So um, as I mentioned, you just info lab, um, uh, just to, to give you a little bit of uh, background, um, we, are, we are funded um, mostly by uh, institutional uh, funders uh, in Europe and in, in Canada, excuse me, in Europe and the United States. Uh, I, I, I would love to be uh, funded as also by partners in Canada, but for the moment, mostly in the United States and Western Europe. Uh, and we use open source investigation techniques and social media network analysis uh, and uh, to, to uncover these disinformation uh, campaigns. And we work with a wider coalition of, of 40, around 40 other uh, think tanks, educators, fact checkers, journalists, uh, cybersecurity professionals, uh, and digital activists to develop new rules in the European Union uh, on this problem. So I think that's enough for, for the introduction. I think uh, to let's dive straight into what we would define as, as the threat. So I think before really going into the pandemic, I think it's useful for us to have a couple of little uh, definitions to understand what we're, what we're talking about. Um, disinformation is an extremely broad topic with a lot of different ways to, to tackle the problem. Um, but we would uh, identify three main issues uh, along with uh, a couple of other partners, misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation as being the expressions of a broader societal problem, which is being termed an, the information disorder. And I think thinking in terms of information disorders is, is a smarter way to think about disinformation because it allows us to understand these three dimensions of the issue, misinformation, which is unintentional sharing of disinformation with no necessary, no intent to harm, just false information. Your family member that accidentally shares a really a bad piece of advice about COVID or, um, or, or something like that. Um, disinformation is really somewhere in the middle, is uh, fabricated, deliberately manipulated content um, that's then, that is then created or used for conspiracies or, or broader rumors. Uh, and malinformation, which is uh, the deliberate use with an intent to harm of genuine information like personal data or company information. And the most uh, obvious examples here are 
are doxing the use of uh, the publicly publicly releasing personal data to uh, to harass someone, or the, one of the most awful examples, of course, is revenge porn. So um, within the sort of this mix, disinformation takes a bit of both, and that is why it is so difficult to to analyze. Um, at the EU Disinfo Lab, we've developed a typology called the, the Few Faces of Disinformation, which allows us to go one step further in distinguishing different types of disinformation campaigns. You have the political disinformation, which is the use of disinformation to undermine adversaries or push an agenda uh, to in a domestic audience, for example. Um, this will, of course, spike during periods of during electoral cycles and, and campaign and political campaigns. Uh, you have lucrative disinformation, which is the use of disinformation to make a profit. Uh, this would be the type of campaign that would be more that would tend to be more constant, not necessarily uh, event specific, and could be taking place over a pretty standard period of time, long period of time, and have at a quite a low intensity in terms of its intent, in terms of its uh, impact on uh, on our democracies. But it is a, a, a big issue, nonetheless. Nonetheless, excuse me. And then thirdly, uh, issue-based uh, disinformation, use of disinformation to advance an ideological or a normative or a financial, financial goal. So again, a bit similar to the political disinformation that can be tied to political parties or certain groups. And then foreign influence, which is a very specific type of disinformation used by foreign actors, usually states, uh, to disrupt societies. And here um, we have an example of, um, the, we have an example that we will talk a bit about uh, later in the presentation, but these are isolated, very hard to find operations that, although they are isolated, have high intensity and long-term political consequences. Here we're talking about um, uh, election hacking uh, in the United States or in France by uh, the Russian GRU. Uh, we're talking about um, uh, sophisticated information operations uh, led by uh, all kinds of different com uh, uh, countries. Uh, and we will again talk a, about a little bit about an example later on. Um, so that's just on the sort of uh, the, the definitional uh, side of things to sort of have a couple of uh, preliminary concepts before we dive into the subject. Matter. So first of all, the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been a game changer in the study of, of disinformation. Um, we've seen an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented volume of, of disinformation. Um, it's not just because Donald Trump was in the White House that disinformation was a problem, but uh, as soon as we had this, this global event uh, unrolling on, uh, on, on social media in a context of uncertainty, uh, in a situation where there was often a lack of transparency and sometimes contradictions taken in the decisions by authorities who were also dealing with a massive crisis for the first time, uh, leading to uh, heavy distrust in some countries against their governments and a situation with real life consequences for uh, the population. Um, when we, at the EU Disinfo Lab, when we try and think about the, the infodemic in, in three main phases, at least in Europe and then the United States, I think it'd be interesting to see if this, uh, this schema, this scheme also works in the Canadian context. I think the first phase was at the beginning of the pandemic, um, which was the storm, panic. It's everyone looking for answers. It's the beginning of, a, of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, everyone is looking for answers. You have disinformation, misinformation spreading everywhere from Russian spies to your grandmother accidentally sharing fake remedies about COVID. And uh, that we saw really stretch until May 2020. Then in June 2020, um, we have summer that arrives, the pandemic calms. And we see a sort of on the in extremist uh, corners of the internet, conspiracy communities consolidating, getting more organized, uh, taking their discussions offline and organizing marches against the COVID-19 restrictions. This is the time when we're seeing big marches in Germany and in France against the measures that have been taken. And then a third phase between November 2020 and May 2021, with the beginning of the vaccine wars on a geopolitical dimension with countries like Russia, and China who are pushing uh, very hard, excuse me, on there uh, for people to take up their vaccine. And on a societal level, uh, we're seeing uh, a general fatigue with two years, a year and a half of COVID-19 measures. And so an, an increased receptiveness to, uh, to uh, sort of vaccine hesitancy and anti-vax uh, dialogue. So anti-vax disinformation then falls into a very fertile uh, ecosystem. 
Um, so, as I was saying before, disinformation damages public service. It damages our our, uh, the, our ability to provide strong public service to, to citizens. Just two examples. There are many, many more in Czechia and Czech Republic. Um, the 112, sort of the equivalent of, of 911 responders uh, in the United States. I don't know what the emergency number in, in Canada is, um, but saw an extreme surge in the number of calls after false rumors were claiming that you could get advice about COVID-19 from, from doctors through this number, uh, sort of uh, hobbling their ability to, to provide emergency services to the rest of society. And then, for example, in the United States, there, there are examples possibly in Canada as well with uh, shortages of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine because of a significant surge in demand for a medicine that is not proved to uh, to, to be a, a serious cure against COVID-19. So again, creating uh, logistical and uh, supply chain problems uh, in the provision of, of medicine. And I, I, I take these examples because we, we forget very often that disinformation has a real world impact that is extremely serious and therefore leads to a... Um, uh, a regulatory response that can match uh, the seriousness of, of the situation. Um, we often say we need more fact checking, yes, in part, but this won't solve the problem completely. And during the, the, the infodemic, we saw a massive increase in the number of fact checking of articles, as you can see from this, this very interesting graph that was published in, in Nature, um, with on, on, the, on the one hand, um, number of articles uh, checked uh, by the different type of categories uh, that cause them to be fact-checked, uh, conspiracy theories, or whether they're about wrong types of cures or spreads. And there you can just see the, the number of articles shooting up uh, around the start of the pandemic in March. And this, is, this has created a huge amount of stress on fact-checking organizations. It's created sort of ex nihilo, a, a new a whole new sector dedicated to, to fact-checking um, articles in the press, and also dedicated to fact-checking articles um, uh, in the scientific community. This is an extremely difficult task, an extremely tiring task. And uh, there is, we're starting to see literature um, uh, talk about the, the, the unintended disadvantages of fact-checking. Of, um, uh, yes, of fact-checking. And for example, the result of putting um, a few fact-checking labels on certain articles in, for example, a mainstream press publication has been shown in a recent study by, by MIT uh, to create a sense of complacency as the reader then imagines that all the other articles on the publication are also fact-checked and have also been verified to the same extent when in fact it is not necessarily the case. And the main point is simply that fact-checkers will never be able to keep up with uh, the flow uh, uh, of, of information. They are facing a, a Sisyphean task, uh, just like uh, Sisyphus being condemned by the Greek gods in ancient mythology to push a stone up a hill uh, to, eternal, uh, to eternity uh, for, for punishment. And fact checkers shouldn't be punished in the same way. So we need a, a better answer than, than fact checking. At the same time, the ecosystem in which this information is developing is becoming increasingly complex. On the one hand, you have a diversification of the distribution channels that this information is using uh, on encrypted platforms like WhatsApp and Telegram that are increasingly uh, being used to share disinformation, which makes it extremely difficult for us as researchers trying to understand where the disinformation is going and what form it's taking, because we cannot see inside the channels for good reason, they are encrypted. But again, another challenge. And then also Parler and Odyssey, uh, platforms that are less moderated, that are further from the public uh, eye and uh, from public scrutiny, and therefore harbor a lot of the disinformation and, and conspiratorial extremist content uh, that was pushed out, moderated out of Facebook, Facebook excuse me, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and, uh, and Instagram and TikTok. And then YouTube is an extremely important platform that is like a, a, a Teflon pro, um, platform. It manages to escape the type of scrutiny that Facebook and Twitter uh, get, Google to an extent, because YouTube uh, is controlled by Google, but um, YouTube is uh, an extremely um, important uh, platform in the spread of disinformation. And somehow it always manages to escape um, uh, the same type of scrutiny that Facebook gets, and it deserves more, more scrutiny. Um, and then on the other hand, monetization. It's easier to, to make money from disinformation through the growth of crowdfunding platforms. And we're going to talk a little bit about crowdfunding platforms now. Um, first of all, an important disclaimer, 
crowdfunding platforms are provide extremely important service. Um, crowdfunding platforms are used to support independent journalists in conflict regions to uh, sort of raise money for uh, community-led initiatives that have a public good. But in certain corners of some of these crowdfunding platforms, they're being abused by either bad actors or conspiracists who are using the platform to um, fundraise uh, QAnon activities, to launch QAnon books, to uh, finance uh, documentaries on why the pandemic is uh, artificial and, and a whole conspiracy. And it's been at a time when advertisers and sort of governments will stop financing disinformation. The, the actors we're talking about, whether it's QAnon, whether it's uh, neo-Nazi groups, uh, far-right groups in Europe, turn to crowdfunding platforms like Patreon, like TP. Um, I think Kickstarts, Kickstarter is one of the most prominent ones in Canada. Uh, and so we saw a big increase in traffic of these platforms during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. Uh, we saw a growth in monetization of conspiratorial and extremist narratives using these platforms and uh, through both indirect and direct ways to, to monetize the issue. So indirectly by um, starting with a, a generally um, innocent uh, advertisement of service that would then lead the user to uh, a QAnon website, for example, or direct monetization where they're, they're simply openly uh, conspiracists or anti-vaxxers are, are just simply openly uh, issuing fundings for uh, issuing calls for financing uh, to fund um, uh, videos uh, that are about um, uh, filled with falsehoods about the pandemic, for example. Um, and so here we have an example of indirect monetization on Patreon, um, a US example uh, for, for QAnon. Uh, and you don't have to look very hard if you want to, if you're, you're bored at work and you want to check a little bit, just go onto Patreon and, and type QAnon and see what comes up. Um, I'm sure you have better things to do. <laughs> uh, direct monetization is a, here's another example. For this case, an American example. Um, Plandemic uh, was one of the uh, most effective uh, conspiratorial um, videos uh, that were that was uh, seeded and, and financed through a, a course of funding on Patreon. And just this graph from the New York Times just shows how viral this content is and how effective uh, it is in, in reaching many people. In, within one week, uh, it managed to garner almost 2.5 million interactions on Facebook and almost 8 million interactions across different platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And that's double, <laughs> triple uh, the, the interest for aerial phenomena found by the Pentagon, your UFO videos on YouTube or the Office reunion or Taylor Swift's new song. So the virality of these uh, pieces of content is extremely strong and, uh, and therefore uh, it becomes, uh, the impact becomes even more pernicious. So that's the infodemic. That's a, a very general overview of disinformation during COVID-19. We also thought it would be interesting um, in a more sort of, in a very specific um, uh, context to show you an example of sophisticated disinformation. So please bear with me. <laughs> um, last year, we launched an investigation called Indian Chronicles, which um, unveiled one of the largest disinformation operations we have ever seen in Europe. Uh, and this was a 15 year long operation that was a textbook information operation extremely sophisticated and had multiple levels uh, and uh, the, the size of which uh, just astounded us. Um, the goal of this operation was to influence uh, a political debate in India through uh, intermediaries in Brussels and in Geneva at using manipulating a debate in the EU and manipulating a debate in Geneva to change a political discussion back home. And so this extremely convoluted system is laundering information through a massive network of fake outlets, over 750 fake outlets in 119 countries, 550 domain names registered, over 10 fake, fake NGOs set up 
fake in the sense that they were accredited by the UN to work on um, uh, issues that they were not initially uh, signing up to, to work on. Uh, so they were misleading the UN's NGO office in, in terms of their work. And active involvement of far-right politicians from Poland and France, whose political agenda um, aligned with uh, the agenda of the people designing this operation and running this operation, and identity thefts of a number of high-profile people, including the former president of the European Parliament and the former UK Secretary of State and BBC Director. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what a large, sophisticated information operation looks like. We talked a bit at the beginning of, the, of this talk about issue-based, lucrative disinformation, um, uh, political uh, disinformation, this is foreign interference. And foreign interference is extremely hard to find, but when you find it, you realize that it can have um, a dangerous impact on, on our democracies. Um, this is how uh, Indian Chronicles, Indian Chronicles is the name we gave to this operation. Why? Because it was an operation that was pushing a pro-India agenda. Now I must say as an important disclaimer that uh, we do not do political attributions to a certain state or a certain government. That is, that is a political decision and that is not the role of uh, NGOs. Our role as an NGO working on disinformation in Europe is to uncover disinformation operations of whatever color, stars or stripes we find, whether they be American, Canadian, Russian, Turkish, Chinese, Indian. But in this case, we found an Indian operation, or at least an operation pushing Indian interests. And we thought it's extremely interesting because it's something that's never talked about. We talk about the Russians a lot, we talk about the Chinese a lot, we never talk about the Indians. And in this case, um, it was, I mean, I won't go too much into the details I've already said. Uh, the, the operation was taking place both in Brussels, both in Geneva, but what was really shocking was the, uh, the, the, the lack of, uh, of, of care or of concern for the identities that uh, the operation was taking. The sort of, it resurrected the identities of, of people who had died, including a former uh, Harvard law professor. Uh, it, it had hijacked the identities of several living people. It set up a fake news portal. It ran the operation both on social media and offline. And it created a an, an whole ecosystem where a fake news outlet was able to generate fake content, then put it on Facebook. That's then recuperated by uh, one of the largest uh, um, media agencies in India and then broadcast back to an audience uh, um, back, in, uh, back in India. So, and then the use of fake NGOs, the use of uh, MEPs in, in Brussels um, just created a, 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 a huge ecosystem that was able to perpetuate uh, fake information. So this is just one example of the type of disinformation when you uh, that you find online when you go behind the scenes and see what uh, see what's going on. Very often it's just someone trying to make a quick buck. Every now and then it is extremely sophisticated actors who have an intent to harm or to change a political agenda. In this case, we don't think the 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 objective of the of the operation was so much to change the European debate. It was more to use European actors to change the debate back in India and to, to use the legitimacy of what seemed to be European MEPs um, when in fact it was just isolated uh, MEPs on either end of the political spectrum to then create uh, an impression, a mirage of institutional support. So manipulating a European debate for a domestic audience back in India. And here you have just an example of, of how content can be laundered online and as it moves from platform to platform or outlet to outlet. Uh, in, in the case of the Economic Times, very reputable uh, and important paper in, in India, probably unwittingly um, reporting uh, a story that once it went through this factory of fake ecosystem, which began with the statement by a single member of the European Parliament, ends up with a headline such as European Parliament facts India's army surgical strikes on Pakistan. From A to Z, there is an entire journey of Chinese whispers that has taken place that is uh, completely fake. <laughs> so um, it's important to, to just cast a, a, a light on operations like this to understand how um, we can disable 
uh, these types of operations. And I said before, there are all types of different uh, state actors and non-state actors engaging in these types of operations. Uh, this is just one. So that's a bit of information on, uh, on the pandemic, on a specific example of sophisticated disinformation. Um, how do we deal with the problem? And how do we assess uh, the, the issue of disinformation? Um, the reason it flows so freely uh, online, for us, there are, we'd say there are two issues. Um, the first is a business model problem for the platforms, which favors virality through uh, powerful content recommender systems uh, and algorithmic amplification that can um, push a disinforming content to a wider audience. Uh, that creates the virality behind a disinformative, disinformative content. And then there is the ad tech model that helps to monetize the virality, uh, the posts that uh, are viral, and then a heavy reliance on behavioral uh, micro-targeting uh, so that we can, they can, the platforms can make sure that the content that is viral uh, is then able to reach as many people as possible in an extremely targeted way. Uh, secondly, there is a lack of enforcement. Um, uh, let the internet legislation in the European Union, in the United States as well, and I'm guessing in Canada as well, is extremely outdated. The last time we did large scale uh, pieces of internet legislation was around the early 2000s to make way for uh, the e-commerce market. Uh, the internet has changed massively in 20 years, and we now need to reorganize it, our legislative landscape when it comes to the internet. Um, this new legislation needs to empower uh, governments to have the enforcement uh, capabilities to uh, ensure that the platforms are not using business models that favor, um, that promote disinformative content. And lastly, this lack of enforcement also comes from extremely difficult balancing act between on the one hand, protecting our freedom of expression, and on the other, protecting ourselves from harm. And this is the, the, the finding the balance between this is what I think has delayed finding a serious uh, political solution. Um, we are starting to make progress, but in Europe at least, we are very attached to our right to privacy. In the United States, they are very attached to their First Amendment rights. We need to find a middle ground between the two. But the problem that we have in Europe is that the companies who are framing the debate on the, on the platform side are largely American platforms who are very attached to a policy discussion in the US and Washington that favors a First Amendment right above all else. And I think they are, they are being confronted by a very different discussion in Europe. And if we're able to make a step forward in Europe on this, it's because we may rate protection from, from harm, protection from digital violence higher in certain contexts than a, a protection, than a freedom of expression. The, the solution has to balance both, and that is a work for judges and for, for politicians, not for NGOs, but that's what we see from, from our vantage points. Um, the problem with the current situation of self-regulation is that there are huge discrepancies in the way social media platforms moderate the content. We see massive differences in how content in Europe uh, is reacted to uh, whether it's in English or whether it's not in English, in French, in Spanish, um, let alone uh, smaller member states uh, and languages like Lithuanian, Bulgarian, um, especially those are two examples that we've seen recently where uh, the disinformation that's been debunked, that's been fact-checked over and over again, reappears simply because the content moderation teams and the policy teams within some of these, some of these companies don't have the linguistic ability to moderate in these languages and therefore end up using Google Translate. I'm not kidding, <laughs> it is crazy. So um, we also see an opacity about why some content is, is removed or stays online. Uh, the, the, the sort of the transparency reporting requirements that are created for these platforms are, are extremely artificial and, and very difficult for the companies to, to, uh, uh, to submit. So, and they, they say this, you know, we, we end up doing completely ridiculous transparency reports for the European Commission. This is what Facebook and Twitter and Google say, for example, publicly. Um, they're, 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 you know, they're being asked to put together very different types of criteria at a time when there are no standardized definitions. So working on definitions is one thing we need to do. And then uh, while we do see uh, sort of regular reporting on the actions taken by platforms, X number of accounts have been taken down. Um, this type of spam has been removed. 
we see absolutely no information on how the companies have taken the information down, how they flagged it, what are their internal processes. And it's extremely difficult to understand what's going on within Facebook like it is within uh, other, other platforms. So, um, and then very quickly on civil society, very often, you know, we will do an investigation and get no response from the platforms, sometimes, uh, sometimes not, um, but that can't happen, especially when we are an accredited organization to do what we are doing. Um, Civil society organizations are harassed, smeared, and attacked online for exposing malicious actors. This is the cost of doing this information research. It's why so few people do it. It's why the people who do do it have to be very good at what they do. And our researchers at Unison Info Lab take a lot on the chin when they do their work um, from online trolls uh, and, and the like. Um, so protection of, of disinformation researchers is important. And then talking about the long-term sustainability of civil society uh, at a time when we are lacking very often uh, financial support or um, sort of psychological support very often, legal support to be able to do the work that we do. And without that, that type of support, uh, civil society is put in jeopardy uh, when uh, it is needed more than ever to fight uh, disinformation. Um, very quickly, because I can see it's 39 minutes past already. Um, one thing I'd, I'd like to, uh, to flag to, to you, you may have seen already, this is the story of Sophie Zhang, who uh, is a heroic lady who used to work at uh, Facebook, who was fired from the company for uh, revealing the work that she did in a public forum, um, uh, for raising the concerns uh, in uh, Facebook's internal messaging uh, system. And uh, she worked on the fake engagement and spam team at Facebook, and uh, she revealed that while the company does do a lot of work and a lot of brave people within the company are trying to, uh, to take down these um, fake engagement uh, campaigns during elections around the world from Honduras to Azerbaijan, um, there is uh, an inability to keep up with, with the issue. And she said it's like emptying the ocean with an eyedropper when she would manage to finally get a sign off from her superiors to, to remove um, uh, fake campaigns uh, in certain countries, uh, that would be great. But then there would be a backlog of several hundreds of other campaigns. And, I, and these revelations by Sophie Zhang were probably the first time that we had a good understanding of what was going on within Facebook at a certain point in time uh, to deal with uh, fake engagement. And, um, hopefully the, the company will be able to, to do better. Um, and what, what we tend to say now is that um, we, we cannot rely on whistleblowers to safeguard our online environment. And it's not the job of companies either to safeguard our democratic debate. It's the role of our, our governments. Um, so finally, in the last two minutes, the response in Europe, there are four dimensions to this response, media platform policy, cyber and foreign policy. Uh, the response in Europe at the moment is focused very much on the platform dimension, very little on the foreign and media dimension, and a little bit on the cybersecurity response. So uh, we need a bit more of all four of those uh, elements. And the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, um, which is the antitrust component of the Digital Services Act, provides us with the first step uh, in Europe to try and deal with this problem. So. It's being negotiated now by the European Parliament and the, and the Council of the EU, and it will give us potentially an answer uh, to this problem by introducing pan-European rules uh, for how to regulate uh, illegal content with very steep fines, 6% fines, 6% of turnover for the companies. Uh, as a reminder, the GDPR on data protection is a 4% fine, I believe. So this is really stepping up the accountability measures against the platforms. But then we also need a number of other issues here as well. Um, we need to support civil society. This is work that we're doing with the Friedrich Neumann Foundation uh, in Europe, uh, mapping the needs of civil society. The same work needs to be done in Canada to understand um, how uh, disinformation researchers are coping with the situation at the moment. They tend to be micro organizations. They tend to be community reliant. They have a strained relationship with companies. They're very often unsure about their future sustainability and they have real cybersecurity issues. They need to spend a lot of money on cyber. And uh, this is one of the, one of the new dimensions of uh, the NGO sector, for example, in the digital space. So when it comes to uh, fostering digital trust in, in government in Canada, 
one of the important solutions is making sure you have a strong civil society. And that's why our three sort of pillars of activity when we talk about this information in terms of how to solve the problem in Europe, at least, is to talk about empowering the community in talking about platform accountability and talking about sanctions. And um, uh, I, we don't have time to go into detail into all three of these elements, but this is how we solve the problem, uh, at least in Europe. So uh, to conclude, um, if you're asking yourself a question of how can dealing with disinformation um, help us increase trust uh, in, in government uh, in Canada, uh, we would say regulate your platforms, empower your civil society, and defend your democracy, uh, because uh, otherwise uh, it, it won't uh, be protected um, uh, by itself. Uh, it needs to be defended. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, that is everything from, from me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, to present to you, and I hope this has been, been useful for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toma. That was uh, incredible um, and very well framed and organized. I think not many of us uh, are as um, informed as to the, the, the structure and the approach and the threat and the techniques being used, but we know that it's out there. The prevalence of disinformation seems to be growing uh, and uh, Canada is not immune, obviously. Um, Toma, in the uh, time that we have, there's, there's, a, there's a number of, uh, there's a couple of questions that I think um, uh, our, uh, our, our participants are, are interested to hear from you on. Uh, one question is, um, and if you can quickly, so we can get to up to hopefully three out of you, if that's possible. Uh, that's my uh, that's my target. Um, there are many more, obviously, but three is what I'm hoping for. Um, uh, is uh, is there a material difference between uh, the techniques used in disinformation that are applied to state governments versus corporations or companies, or are they one, are they the same instruments? Uh, I think, uh, what, what exactly do you mean that the techniques that are used against um, against governments? So in terms of the um, uh, the strategies and the approaches uh, being employed by, by I guess, uh, nefarious forces, um, sometimes they're, they're out there misaligning corporations and sometimes they're targeting uh, actual state uh, governments and democracies. And I guess, is there um, a difference between the tools that are being used by those forces for uh, one target versus the other? I think, um, I think it's, it's a really good question. And um, uh, I would tend to say um, that there is, there is a feeling that it is possible to act with impunity when you are uh, targeting big international organizations, uh, especially big organizations, but I think national governments also fall into this, this situation because there is an inability to act. Um, while if you target a company uh, in your disinformation campaign, you run the risk of being sued. Um, and the company is able to mobilize huge resources uh, to, to attack you for defamation or all types of things. A government uh, being the victim of, of a disinformation campaign, if I've understood your, your question correctly, uh, is a much bigger target and a much easier target. And until we give ourselves the means to sanction bad actors, they will keep on um, disinforming against our governments and also using our governments in uh, content laundering operations uh, for their own uh, for their own goals. Thank you, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, and. Um, just to build off your earlier comment about civil society, private corporations as part of civil society, uh, I, I would say probably have a responsibility to counteract against disinformation and be uh, contributors to, uh, to fighting against uh, such practices too. So thank you. Um, Toma, uh, just moving in a slightly um, different direction, there's been quite a bit uh, in North America uh, recently on the, uh, the employment of ransomware and ransomware is becoming more prevalent too. Are they being used by the same actors or are they just close cousins? What, what are your, what's your, uh, your view or your observation of the use of ransomware in, uh, in the public discourse? Um, so I, I, need, I, I 
wouldn't say too much about ransomware because um, we're not cybersecurity professionals and that, that has really become an area of expertise all in itself as another attack vector that is used to target organizations. So you can, you can see it as a different weapon almost. So you have a disinformation campaign, uh, which is a, a very, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of a, a bad quality uh, grenade. Uh, and a piece of malware, which is a, a much more um, brute force type weapon to, to hurt organizations. And both are very often used, uh, combined in the same attack package. And um, I think a lot of work has to be done in the cybersecurity sector on how to uh, understand the link between, between the two. Um, the, the two weapons being in the arsenal used by bad actors. And, uh, and we are, the, there is, I think an overlap between uh, disinformation, people running disinformation campaigns and delivering malware attacks. But I couldn't say that for certain because I'm not a cybersecurity expert, we're disinformation experts. No, that's super helpful. I think I think that uh, recognizing it, that it's um, it's another, as you say, um, technique used by others to, to, to achieve similar, similar lands. Um, my final question, uh, Tom, if you'll permit, is uh, Canada is turning its attention to this question. We are, we do, there is legislation that is currently being debated on how to reg regulate uh, social media platforms uh, a bit better. Um, um, but in terms of uh, the role that the disinformation pl uh, lab plays in, in, in Europe, in the European community, what advice or would you have for uh, Canada in terms of establishing a similar body, uh, such as the Disinformation Lab? What were some of the obstacles that you, uh, you, uh, you encountered and, and what, uh, what advice would you provide uh, Canada on, on approaching uh, creating a similar entity? I think uh, it's, it's a really important question. And uh, I think uh, Canada is exactly the type of, com uh, of, of country that um, is able to support organizations um, in this space, um, uh, because you you have a, an attachment to uh, to a certain type of, of, of democracy and a willingness to put support civil society, the the solution um, is um, is one where you're able to provide funding uh, to NGOs without uh, ordering them to have an editorial slant in their research to make sure that they are given the tools and resources uh, to conduct. Uh, disinformation as you uh, as they see fit, and that editorial independence and in disinformation research is especially important when the money is coming from public sources. Because, uh, as you've seen in the presentation, we very quickly get into political and geopolitical debates that could uh, not serve necessarily the interests of, for example, your uh, your Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but. If the goal is to tackle disinformation, then it has to be tackled in all of its forms. And we can't allow, for example, disinformation by our allies and denounce it when it's done by our adversaries. We are in the business of, dis of, de of denouncing disinformation in all its forms because it's bad for democracy. So if you're, if you're funding civil society working on this issue, you need to make sure they have the editorial independence. And then you need to make sure they're funded on cybersecurity, on legal support, uh, and that they have that sustainability to do the work long term with core funding and not on a project piecemeal basis. And a strong civil society gives you a strong democracy. That you can see that. Oh, fantastic! Well, that was a, a great um, a response to end on, uh, Toma. Thank you very much. Very inspirational. Uh, thank you once again for making uh, yourself available and making the disinformation lab uh, uh, better known in. Uh, in, in Canada, I think we're uh, very interested in hearing more about uh, what is uh, what you're doing, and we'll continue to uh, to work closely with you. Um, thank you uh, to all that uh, sent in questions, and uh, now I'll just ask uh, Toby to take us into the next presentation once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, uh, Thomas. And as you can see from the uh, slide that's been put up, we're going to uh, we're going to follow. The, the conversation that Thomas has started. Um, we're going to be sharing with you some preliminary findings of, I think, some very exciting research that the IOG is just completing thanks to a grant from the Department of Canadian Heritage. And it's totally consistent with the kind of uh, information that Thomas has been giving us. 
The purpose of this study was to provide in-depth analysis using artificial intelligence on how social media disinformation impacts Canadians' trust in government. And from that, their views on the federal government's ability to make decisions on and specifically implement specific complex policy issues. And our premise in starting this project was that declining social cohesion, that story about civil society empowerment perhaps that Tomas is talking about, is making it more difficult for governments to discuss and find consensus for the big and important challenges they face. Before I introduce um, uh, the, this, uh, uh, the project itself, I encourage you to send questions and comments in via Zoom, YouTube, or Slido. And this presentation will be followed by a short discussion moderated by Catherine Waters, the senior practice lead at the IOG. So let me introduce um, our VP, Brad Graham, who has been leading this research uh, to take you through our preliminary findings. Brad, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Sylvie, for that introduction. And thank you for advising people on how to add questions in Zoom, YouTube, and Slack. Catherine will be moderating. Um, and that is being put up in the chat function now. And uh, uh, hopefully we'll get to uh, several questions uh, and we will be taking a break after our presentation. I must say it's different to present in a Zoom world because usually when I was giving a presentation in front of a live audience um, uh, or speech, I'd like to break the ice with a bit of humor. But of course in a Zoom world with everyone muted, all I hear is nothing but stone cold silence which quite frankly is, is kind of comforting to me because usually that's the response to my humor got to in-person audiences. So I'm feeling quite at ease. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank our partners for uh, the research project. In particular, as Toby mentioned, um, our good friends at the Department of uh, Canadian Heritage and uh, the project was funded through the Digital Citizen Contribution Program. And our research partnership, of course, made up by the Institute on Governance and a special shout out to Shelby Torres and Toby Fife, who have been instrumental, as well as Laurie Turnbull from Dalhousie University, who after the break, you'll be hearing from on a dynamic panel. And our good friends at Advanced Symbolics who built our artificial intelligence model called Poly. And while I will describe how Poly works, um, and you know how we derived our you know philosophical cohorts and our sentiment index and how we sampled and all the like um and because that's important to understand but if there happens to be any phds and statistics out there uh that want to get into um very large detail about how we use bayesian point estimation to distribute people along our philosophical uh, spectrum. I may have to leave that for an offline answer or to put you in touch with our good friends um, at ASI. But in terms of the project overview, um, you know, why did we want to undertake this project? Well, first, like all of you, we know that trust is declining, not just in Canada, but around social uh, or Western democracies around the world, a bit more muted in Canada, but nonetheless, very troubling. And of course, at the IOG, we're thinking about, well, what does this mean for government governance? And in particular, what does it mean for government's ability to deal with some of the big issues that lay before Canada? Uh, things like systemic racism and climate change. And relatedly, um, what is the role of disinformation? We know disinformation exists, but does it have an impact on trust? In other words, does it have any traction? And we'll be presenting a, a bit of a case study at the end of this very briefly. So, you know, quickly the overview, we used AI modeling, uh, not just to measure trust, but also the components of trust and sentiment across major policy areas, ideological cohorts, demography, and regions. And again, we use this technique to examine a specific case of misinformation with regard to COVID. So first to start off, what is trust? We used a very simple definition, but yet powerful of the OECD. And that's a person's belief that another person or institution will act consistently with their expectations of uh, positive behavior. Now, as I go through my presentation and present a bit of the data, I would like you to remember that trust in government is low right now. Um, and as a matter of fact, we show a three-year average of uh, trust in government at about 57%, uh, 
which is very much in line with other measures as has been docu documented by the Edelman Trust Barometer and Ipsos Good Work and the like. So on the one hand, I'm somewhat comforted that our re uh, results of trust match other studies using completely different technologies and methodologies, but on the other hand, I remain uh, somewhat kind of depressed as someone who cares about public policy and, and trust in government. And I ask you to remember that because as I go through some of our statistics, we'll be looking at the increment in, and in the short term. So you'll see some positive movements. But again, one has to remember the overall environment in which we operate in. Now, those um, all up numbers of trust or measures are completely valid. In other words, when pollsters ask Canadians, do you trust government? Yes, no. Um, you know, people do all the algorithms in their own head about sentiment, feelings, and experiences. Um, and so those, those numbers are valid. But what we wanted to do was break it down even further to deconstruct trust. And to do that, we use the OECD components of trust, fairness, integrity, openness, and reliability, and responsiveness, and mainly to understand, um, do certain components of trust matter more than others? And the quick answer to that is yes, they do. And again, remembering the presence uh, or the premise of the project, we wanted to look at trust uh, over major policy challenges facing Canada. The list is here. Big challenges like climate change, immigration, systemic racism, and Western alienation. And we wanted to see, does trust of Canadians change over those challenges? And perhaps why? And again, the quick answer to that question, do they change? The quick answer is yes. Now, briefly, the AI model we used, of course, affectionately called Polly. We had to teach Polly what trust is and its components, as well as the six major policy areas. And that we do that by feeding it uh, definitions, lots of articles um, and the like, and it self-learns and then goes out and continues to learn. And at the same time, we generated a large scale randomized representative sample of Canadians, uh, uh, 300,000 people. <clears throat> and the data I'll be showing you this morning uh, relates um, to Twitter. And again, I'll rem remind you to remember when we're looking at the statistics that the results we show relate to trust in government. Um, not that, you know, people like something or dislike something. Now, clearly like and trust are very related because if you like something, chances are you might trust them, or if you trust them, that may be one reason you like them, but they are indeed different concepts. For example, I very, very much like the Toronto Maple Leafs, but I have absolutely no faith or trust in them as has been recently evidenced. Now, we also look at political cohorts, and I just want to show you this. Um, we did distribute the representative sample of the 300,000 Canadians across a philosophical spectrum. And basically that's based on uh, people's social and political circle, friends, followers. And for example, if people follow certain right-wing media, they are so classified. Um, and again, we broke it down and I'll talk a little bit about this, the far left at 5%, the left center and right at 30 and the far right at 5%. Now, there is a fairly sophisticated uh, algorithm that does this based on some research in the United States and uh, some work done called Birds of a Feather, which allocates um, uh, tweets and Twitterers um, along the philosophical spectrum. And once you have that laid out in relation to an, uh, one another, then you can label them as we have done. Now, the labeling part, not the placement, the placement is done by a fairly rigorous algorithm, but the labeling um, is selective. Um, and we, if you will, identify things like the far right, because that 5%, as you'll see in the data, is quite distinct. Now, you can label um, the others a little bit looser or tighter. Um, the algorithm doesn't determine the labels. What it does is place people relative on a philosophical spectrum. And finally, before we get into data, I wanna send a word on sentiment. In other words, how people feel about trust in government. And we, and our folks at ASI use the natural language processing technique that basically categorizes language according to associated emotions. Now the algorithm is fairly sophisticated, but the concept is fairly simple. 
In other words, if Pauli saw a tweet that said, the government is inept, incompetent, and corrupt. Well, it's pretty obvious. Those were all negative words. And that tweet would have been uh, received a negative sentiment overall. So you get the concept. Now the algorithm is fairly sophisticated, but again, the process is um, fairly straightforward. Now we're gonna to turn uh, to some initial data. And as Toby mentioned, we're calling this preliminary data. All the data is real, it's, it's, it's rigorous. But what we need to do and what we're doing now is looking deeper perhaps at some of the causal relationships and some of the interrelationships of some of the data that I'll be presenting to you this morning. But as I said, it is valid and hopefully you will find it insightful um, and interesting. And again, this is just a three-year longitudinal trust um, indicator, overall trust. And what we're seeing is a 57% three-year average. We can go back to 2012 and we will be doing that. But this will just show you what's been happening, a bunch of ups and downs. And again, I'll remind you, it's in line with other research uh, about trust in government in Canada. Now, what we do see is, is some peaks and valleys, of course, and I'll speak more precisely about the COVID-19 experience, but there seems to be a bit of a, a lull and then a bump uh, before an election. Uh, of course, in October, the fall of 18, we had uh, a number of municipal elections and of course the federal election in fall of uh, 2019. And I guess the little, the little uh, divot ahead of the election may speak to some of the things Thomas was talking about, about lots of activities around an election and it's quite charged, but then seemingly after an election, uh, I suppose those that uh, were victorious in the election are tweeting a lot and feeling uh, pretty good about it. Um, and of course there's other things going into that as well, but the, you know, there's, there's clear, clear peaks there. If we look specifically at COVID and its aftermath, Again, you see the dip of um, trust um, just heading into the federal election and then peaking at 67%. And then of course you see a decline. Now at the onset of COVID, you see a peak. Uh, and of course people very much paying attention to government. Um, lots of information we had uh, along Twitter. Um, and then a bit of a decline um, owing to, you know, some debate around how we manage it, what's our initial response, but then we see a kind of uh, increase uh, in trust um, in the late spring. And that's, you know, governments coming together, um, chief medical officers of health uh, speaking daily with lots of credible information. So, you know, rallying around the flag, we're all in this together. So again, these are overall macro measures of trust. Uh, and of course, we've seen the COVID bump be replaced now as, you know, there's lots of debates around uh, public health measures, what should be open, what should be closed. And it seems to have reverted a bit to the kind of polarizing kind of debate around public health responses, not nearly to the extent that we see in the United States where, you know, wearing a mask uh, seemed to indicate whether you were a Republican or a Democrat. And in, in Canada, we were a little bit more um, rational than that. So I'm going to start now breaking down, and before we get into the issues very quickly, the components of trust. And again, this is in a pre and post COVID world. And again, our study will go back further in time. But you see pre COVID, you know, components kind of bundled together. Um, things like openness on the red and uh, responsiveness, you know, key. Um, integrity of government, the yellow line, uh, peaking, of course, as you'll recall, there were a number of governments issues across all orders of government, um, some scandals and the like. So you see peaks of integrity. Post COVID, or as sorry, as COVID took hold, you really see responsiveness um, um, separate itself, as well as openness. And this has a lot to do, of course, with people's concerns about COVID, the management of COVID, and also the degree of which information is being made available by government. So this is, is kind of really good news, um, you know, that people are really responding um, to, to, you know, responsiveness as well as openness. But there is a distinct difference, um, and I'll just highlight, between 
how you feel about uh, components of trust to where you are on the political spectrum. I won't go into great detail, but basically on, you know, the, the gray or light blue and dark blue represent the right and far right, and the red and kind of orangey um, uh, colors represent the uh, far left and left. Now, what you see here is people putting more emphasis on, on the left and far left on things like responsiveness and openness. Now, the dark blue and blue, the right and far right, you see far more um, emphasis when it comes to the component of reliability, integrity, and fairness. Now, we have to dig deeper into this, but this does reflect a bit of the kind of the polls view of a lot of things, not the least of which may be the role of government. And again, this is very preliminary, but initially it's telling me that on the far left, there's a lot more active kind of components of trust, things like responsiveness and openness and doing. And on the right, it's more about, you know, uh, you know to oversimplify it, kind of peace, order and good government, that government should be reliable, uh, it should have integrity, and it should be fair to all Canadians, which is a, a different um, view. Quickly now, just a heat map on sentiment, uh, just a couple of interesting things here. Again, this is sentiment with regard to trust in government. It doesn't speak about whether people are happy, um, but it does tell a bit of a story that, uh, interestingly, what stands out immediately is that in Alberta and Saskatchewan, they're the only provinces with an overall negative sentiment toward trust in government. Um, there's a little bit of um, uh, skepticism about trust in government in BC and the Yukon, um, while people in the Northwest Territory, Central Canada, seem to be somewhat in the middle, somewhat neutral, while people in, um, in uh, Nunavut and New Brunswick and uh, Newfoundland seem to be downright giddy about trust in government. And that's not to say, as I said, that people in Alberta and Saskatchewan are generally grumpy people. It just means that their sentiment toward trust in government is, is negative. But there's an interesting uh, coin flip on this one. And let me just explain this graph for a moment. This is the total level of engagement by sentiment on Western alienation. Now, the surprise, and it's on a per capita basis. The surprising thing to me on this is that people in Quebec, BC and Ontario are tweeting at two to four times the rate, again, per capita rate, than the people in Alberta and Saskatchewan when it comes to Western alienation. The other interesting feature of this is that particularly people in Ontario are tweeting at between two and three times the rate and negatively uh, with regard to trust in government and Western alienation than the people in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So apparently Ontario is somehow feeling more alienated about the fact that the West feel is alienated. So I leave that for you. We'll be delving a little bit deeper into that. So I'm going to uh, quickly go through some uh, areas of policy engagement and um, as well as sentiment. But first, if you look at the engagement across policy areas along an ideological spectrum, again, you can see the far right, that last 5% dark blue, very much engaged more so than anyone else uh, across all policy fields. So I picked four here. Now, interesting, um, Western alienation, strong on the far right, generally low throughout um, relatively, but I must say it's a sporadic type of activity. For example, we saw lots of spikes with Kenny's famous, you know, fair deal speech and, and the resulting release of the fair deal commission report. This is a little bit of um, mutes that out a little bit. Immigration is fairly consistent. Again, a lot of activity on the far right. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, systemic racism, a lot of activity um, on the left and far left, as well as the far right. And similarly regarding uh, climate change, lots of net activity on the polls uh, and a lot of strong activity, which we can see from what we're now looking at is average sentiment regarding trust in government by policy area, by ideological spectrum. Now, again, not surprising, a lot of negative views 
um, with regard to trust in government, strong on the far right. And again, what I mentioned, remember our bubbles about particularly people in Ontario tweeting very negatively on Western alienation. They see it more as a political negotiating ploy being used by the government of the day, particularly in Alberta, against the federal government. So there's a lot of negative reaction. Now, uh, can I interrupt you for one second, Brad? We've had a question about the x axis on this screen. Can you just explain what the x axis, the numbers on the horizontal line, what those mean? Oh, sorry. These are just the, um, it should be labeled better. These are the political cohorts. So these are the 5%, say the 5% on the far right, and the political cohorts are broken down in 5% increments. This, this is mislabeled. Sorry. Okay, very good question. Thank you for that. Um, again, on climate change, much more distributed. But I should also say, this is somewhat good news if we're looking at the challenge of climate change. Um, despite negativity around the far right regarding climate change and trusting government, uh, very concerned about you know, the investments being made and indeed the social engineering that is perceived to be going on by reordering the economy and the like, but a lot of positivity across the political spectrum. One thing we got to dive deeper into is a little negative uh, sentiment here on the middle left, I'll call it. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that now, but it's a bit of an oddity. But generally speaking, Canadians are positive about uh, government's ability to deal with uh, climate change. And indeed, we're seeing that Canadians are confident that Canada is up to the challenge. The really interesting policy challenge is that of systemic racism. This is really unique uh, when looking at this type of data and our friends and colleagues at ASI, you know, are quite, um, you know, do, do mention that this is quite rare where we have negative sentiment on an issue across the entire political spectrum. Um, obviously much negative in the far right, but very negative in the far left. Now, while all negative, and this is why it's important to break things down a bit from an all up number. Uh, trust in government is very low in systemic racism, but low for very, very different reasons across the political spectrum. For example, on the left, center left and far left, trust is low in government, A, that they will be able, they will do something to deal with systemic racism or that they are capable. Whereas on the right, and I'll oversimplify here, that there tends to be a negative sentiment on trust in government because they see government uh, somehow attacking um, classic Canadian institutions or they're reacting to the, the calls of, for you know, reviews of systemic racism in institutions, particularly like the RCMP. Whereas on the left, you'll pick up that there is a percent or, or, or feeling of high degree of systemic racism in Canadian institutions like systemic or like the RCMP. So very important that we understand uh, that. Um, I'm gonna breeze, breeze through this very quickly. Um, just this shows the level of engagement across policy areas. Um, clearly some peaks on climate change and I must point out the obvious systemic racism with the murder of George Floyd. You see a sharp peak in um, tweets about trust in government and systemic racism. And the, the late bump here, of course, and climate change as a result of you know, Canada's emissions targets increasing. And again, this just breaks it down uh, in, in more precisely total level of activity on climate change and breaking by ideology and again strong reaction on the right as a result of the new uh, Canada emission targets uh, but lots of activity and again systemic racism sharp increase uh, as a relate or you know at the time of the George Floyd murder and again all kinds of activity uh, parallel paralleling one another similarly with immigration lots of activity and again bundling by ideological uh, cohorts, sharp spikes as new targets were announced um, by the far right. And of course, you know, I refer you to a Globe and Mail article this morning about the increase in extremism and specifically mentioning 
um, immigration. Okay, very quickly, I know we're running out of time. I do want to uh, mention um, misinformation, just to add some flavor to what Thomas was saying earlier uh, today. We basically used um, some uh, examples of misinformation from ASI who had been doing some work with various medical associations. Um, so the, the, the quote unquote misinformation was, was verified, you know, things like, um, you know, hydroxychloroquine as a cure for COVID. And we ran it through poly and, and this is the results we get. A couple of interesting observations, which we are going to have to delve in deeper. Lots of activity um, with the onset of COVID and a lot of misinformation, but a lot of activity by the left. And again, numerically much greater uh, numbers of people, but lots of activity. But when you break it down by engagement per 100,000, you really see the far right uh, active, far more active on a per 100,000 case basis. Now, the question we have to delve deeper in is one, does this heavy activity by the far right on misinformation affect other cohorts and how is it affecting? In other words, does it influence or the other hypothesis is, is the center and the left refudiating? In other words, uh, tweeting actively to refudiate uh, misinformation claims. So at this stage, I don't have an answer for you. We are looking at it, but clearly there is an effect. Um, misinformation, uh, particularly with COVID-19, uh, far more active on the far right. Okay, I'll finish off just with a couple of initial observations, heavy on the initial and observation as we continue our work. Um, first of all, people do value some components of trust more than others, and it does vary across the ideological spectrum. And lack of trust of government can result from completely different perspectives. In other words, the government is doing too much, the government is doing not enough. So it's important to deconstruct this. And trust sentiment and engagements are far more pronounced at either end of the ideological spectrum and very pronounced when it comes to the uh, far 5% on the far right. Now, in terms of policy areas, I just went through that, but you know, the good news is that people are confident and fairly trusting of government when it comes to climate change and in other Canadians' ability to meet the challenges. The right is more skeptical and the far right is actually much more suspicious of the investment and motives. And systemic racism is going to be, and we know is a difficult issue, but governments in their uh, response face a spectrum where all across the philosophical spectrum, there is mistrust of government in dealing with this issue. That the center left feeling that the government will not or cannot do enough. And the center right, again, this is a simplistic interpretation, is that somehow defensive of Canadian institutions. Um, I'll leave that for you that, and we will be delving further down into this. And when it comes to misinformation, just from our small example, the far right is far more active and more negative. And the other thing about the far right, when it comes to trust in government, they tend to that 5%, they tend to really personalize their mistrust of government. In other words, it's about the prime minister or it's about the premier. Uh, so very personalized. And again, looking at the COVID uh, example, the far right is far more engaged. Uh, but right now we have to, you know, do some further work to see what kind of influence or traction it does have. Now, finally, in terms of government, you know, despite the fact, as I mentioned, climate change, there's a bit of room for optimism or about, you know, people's trust in government to deal with climate change. We got to remember that overall trust of Canadians remains low. And the other thing I'd like to mention, you know, I've spent 25 years in government and, you know, all my friends and colleagues in public sector folk, there somehow seems to be this perception that trusting, declining trust in government is somehow this exogenous force that is being exerted upon government. And I always remind them that, yeah, you know, but you're also part of it. In other words, governments are not innocent bystanders to declining trust. Governments' actions and words matter, and they ha governments have to understand that after they're uh, to be a part of restoring trust. And again, relatedly, trust is affected by day-to-day -day events. We see the peaks and we see the valleys. Um, but 
it's also maintained and eroded over the long term. So in other words, you may win the news cycle, but you may very well be you know, contributing to you know, uh, declines in social cohesion and trust in government. Just something to remember. And you know, a phrase someone else smarter than me came up with, but I really like, you know, governments might consider more institutional humility. In other words, you know, not, not one policy is perfect and shouldn't be defended or presented that way, that there are always alternatives, there are other perspectives. And there is a need for more discussion and understanding and less, you know, winner take all, if you will. But those are some initial uh, views and observations and some of our data. And I know I've gone over a little bit, uh, Catherine, I apologize. Uh, but I'd be more than willing to take a question or two if in your good judgment you think we have time or not. Thank you. We've, uh, Brad, that was great. Thank you so much. And thank you to the people who've been putting questions into uh, the Zoom and to Slido. Uh, I'm going to start with one that's really important because we've had a number of people ask, but what? how can we get a, a hold of this information, this stack, this in, any report that comes out of this work? Uh, by the IOG and partners? Oh, I will be releasing a paper uh, in the summer. Uh, and judging from the data that we now have, there's going to be a lot of work uh, that we'll be doing when it comes to a disinformation, you know, the components of trust and the like. But we'll get our summary research out, which will explain all the methodology in great detail. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of data. So we've got a lot to, lot to work from. Good. So we'll make sure that everybody who's connected on this uh, on this event today will be receiving links or information about further reports on this. Uh, quick, most of the questions are actually about poly, which is intriguing, but we probably won't deal with that right now. Um, uh, with apologies to those people who asked those questions, I would like to ask one question about correlated trust in government with voter turnout. Uh, we didn't look at that um, specifically, um, and that's a, that's something that's a very good idea that I think we will take up on. We looked at primarily trust and activity on social media, but that would be very easy to match uh, voter turnout, uh, people's social media activity, and how they feel about government, uh, and particularly be interesting um, to see, you know, what relationships we can form. It wasn't in the study, but that's a that's a great idea to take a look at participation. Thank you. Listen, I think it's the most important thing now is to take a break. Uh, I'm going to say a big thank you to Brad for that really great um, and very informative uh, in presentation. And it just whets our appetite for the more uh, research that will be following from this. So please stay tuned, everybody, because there will be more information. And also, you know where we are at the IOG. So don't hesitate to get in touch uh, after this event next week, next month, anytime, if you have other questions or thoughts or ideas that uh, we should be considering. So thank you to Brad and thank you to everyone with questions. Um, I am gonna kick off a 10 minute break now. Um, 10, I'm, I'm looking at my watch, it says 1026. So we will start in exactly 10 minutes. And thank you to everybody, have a good break and we will start again with our panel in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 70 minute panel discussion entitled Declining Trust, Increasing Challenges. In this session, we will discuss the state of trust in government, declining public trust and its impact on public policy challenges, and how government can rebuild trust in the US, the UK, and in Canada. In a moment, I will introduce our panelists, and then they will each deliver a short presentation. After their presentations, we'll have time for Q&A from the audience. But first, I have two short housekeeping announcements. If you are just joining us, there are four ways to get your questions to our panel. You can submit it in the Zoom chat, the YouTube chat, the Slack chat, or directly to our Slido page for this panel. Our team behind the scenes will be feeding all these questions to the Slido page where you can vote on each other's questions. We kindly ask that you submit your question only once. My second housekeeping announcement is that there, this is the last session that we will be live streaming this morning. The live stream feed will be paused from about 11.45 a.m. until 1 p.m. Eastern time. However, there is an interactive activity scheduled from 11.45 a.m. until noon. My colleagues, Gafar Sadek and Catherine Waters, will lead anyone who's interested through a series of group activities in Slack. These activities are designed to unpack your thoughts on the leading cause of declining public trust. If you're not on Slack and you think that sounds fun, there is now a link in your respective chats. Click on that link and when we wrap up at 11.45, you are welcome to join the activity. So now let's move to our panel presentations. Anna, sorry, Becky here. I just wanna clarify that a little bit. The breakouts will also be in Zoom. So you're welcome to remain in the Zoom room from 11.45 to 12.15 to also participate in the breakout sessions. So the, the YouTube live stream will be ending and that's where the Slack alternative comes in. Just to reiterate, if you're in Zoom, uh, you can stick around. Okay, thanks for that. So now let's move to our panel presentations. Our first panelist is Carol Doherty. Carol is the Director of Political Research at the Pew Research Center in Washington, DC, where he plays a leading role in developing the center's research agenda and overseeing editorial content about long-term trends in political values, US views on policy and priorities, and political knowledge and news interest. Carol, over to you. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed Brad's uh, presentation earlier. A lot of uh, similarities between uh, what's happening in Canada and what's happening in the United States. We're, we're fortunate that we have a very long um, trend on uh, views of government, trust in government in the United States. And it starts back in the 1950s and goes all the way to the current day. We just updated it a few weeks ago. And, and the story, as you might expect, is, is pretty grim in the sense that there's been a long gradual decline in trust in government over the last 60 years in the United States in the Johnson administration, even the Richard Nixon administration, the trust in government was uh, routinely above 50%, 60% saying they could trust the government in Washington to do the right thing. Our most recent reading is at 24%. And, and this has been, uh, trust has been at about that level for well more than a decade now through Democratic and Republican presidents alike. And so it's a, it's a constant condition. It hasn't changed a great deal. The last time uh, we saw a spike in the public's trust in government was in the months after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And there was this extraordinary and extraordinarily short-lived uh, you know, unifying effect of the attacks had on the public views of government and uh, trust soared, but then uh, quickly eroded once again. And, and we can see a number of causes for this over the years. I mean, the first, of course, is when you see this first decline in trust in the 1970s, Obviously, the, the, the Watergate scandal, the shock of the Watergate scandal, and probably more importantly, the Vietnam War, uh, definitely was the first uh, factor that, that started eroding the public's trust in government. And then basically, it really hasn't recovered altogether, except on, uh, on occasion since then. But I think over the last decade or so, you really see this persistently low level of trust in government in the United States. And, you know, and we see it with other institutions as well. I mean, there's been a, there's been a decline in trust in many major, not all institutions in the United States, but many major institutions, including the media. 
businesses, uh, even religion, we see we see less confidence in religious leaders than we've seen in the past. And and uh, the other the other factor here, especially in recent years, is the partisan polarization we see in the United States. Now, I would say that trust is low among members of both parties, but especially those uh, on the on the in the out party, the party that's not controlling government. Our most recent measure, with 36 percent of Democrats uh, said they could trust the government, versus nine percent of, of uh, Republicans. And so, you know, four times as many there, and you see this rigid partisan polarization. And I would suggest that Brad's views about the about the information environment apply to the United States as well. Most people, and the one thing Republicans and Democrats can agree on is that they don't agree on basic facts about important issues. 73% say they can't agree on even the basic facts about issues, much less policies. And so with all that, the, the grim picture, what is, what is the bright spot? Well, there is certainly more trust in local government in the United States than in the, in the federal government. You see that consistently. Although I would say that even some of the trends, the, the, the nationalizing effect uh, we see you know, ac across issues, we see with local governments as well. But I, do, I would say that there is more uh, trust in local governments. And I will close with this. We, we have done a lot of work in this area and we actually asked Americans what they thought about could, could actually restore trust in government and other institutions. And they stressed the local angle, also the interpersonal angle, the, the idea that the neighbor who may hold different views politically uh, is not your enemy and just holds different views politically. And so with that, we have a lot of data. I'm ready to answer any questions, but I want to move it along to our next panelist. Thank you, Carol. Our second panelist is Tom Sass. Tom is an associate director at the Institute for Government in London, England. Tom's research covers government outsourcing, civil service reform, and policymaking. He also delivers the Institute's training program on how government works. Tom, over to you. Thanks, Rhonda. Just a quick question. Did you want me to turn my video on? Because I can't actually see you or Carol at the moment, but that may be my screen. Uh, yes, please do turn your video on. Yeah, okay. There you go. Ho hopefully you can all see me now. Um, well, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, we're very pleased to have found a sort of sister institute in the IOG that's interested in many of the same questions that we at the Institute for Government in the UK grapple with. And I think this is a really fascinating subject. You know, we've got the G7 gathering in, in sunny Cornwall to discuss COVID, climate, tax reform, long-term resilience. Trust is clearly going to be critical to whether liberal democracies can tackle any of those uh, challenges. So I'm going to offer a brief US perspective, uh, sorry, UK perspective on trust in government. And I'm going to suggest that while there are some overlaps, I think issues around trust in government and what it means for policy challenges are quite distinct between different countries uh, and based on particular sort of cultural, social, uh, economic, political factors. So I think there's a bit of a danger in, in too much sort of direct read across, even if there are important lessons to be shared between different countries. Um, so if you start with the data, if you look at the OECD data set, uh, which I think Brad based some of his, his work on, on trust in government. Actually, the UK, and, and that's defined as, as the proportion of people who report having confidence in national government, um, the UK comes out even lower than the US and Canada. So the UK is down at 35% of people saying that, uh, around the level of Italy uh, and some middle income countries, Brazil, Colombia. I, I realise there might be sort of slightly different figures with different surveys and, and methodologies. Um, but the key thing, and similar to as Carol was saying for the US, is that the UK has, has had a pretty steep decline so from 50% in 2010 down to about 35% now. Uh, and this is backed up by the British Social Attitudes Survey. So just 15% of people now say that they trust government always or most of the time. That's down from about 50% in 1986. Um, if you look at other countries in Europe, though, in Germany, trust has been consistently rising over this period. Uh, so I think from these headline numbers, you start to get a picture that there might be some common underlying trends, but there's some quite distinct national factors too. Um, I think the sort of crude headline trust in government 
figure only gets you so far, because I think the issue Brad's really importantly getting to is also one of polarisation. And I think on this, we start to see some of the big differences in the UK compared to the US. Um, so most of the polling in the UK suggests that the strongest polarisation is driven by feelings of political marginalisation, uh, differing economic outcomes. There will be debates for many, many years about the meaning of the Brexit vote, but I think the most convincing explanations of that run through those two issues, uh, and Brexit's clearly become a pretty strong sort of identity marker for people. people polling shows people feel more strongly about it than they do about uh, political parties. But if those issues of political marginalisation sound uh, familiar, there are also some pretty big differences around polarisation uh, on so-called culture war issues or climate issues. So in short, British people currently at least aren't anywhere near as animated as, about these issues as, as Americans are. Uh, polling shows that you know, most Britons don't know what the term woke means, or if they are woke, they're not pro or anti, they just don't care. Um, if you ask them about whether immigration has been a bad thing for Britain, just one in four Britons say yes. Uh, and interestingly, that figure for uh, red wall seats, which is the sort of northern towns which Boris Johnson has just won its majority on, is also one in three. So it's pretty similar. Those are the sort of equivalent of the US Rust Belt, potentially. Um, three in four Britain think it's important to teach school children about the role of the slave trade. Three in four were red wall voters too, do too. Uh, and on climate, Britain's much less polarised. You've got broad based support, as Brad was saying, you have in Canada. And we've had that since Margaret Thatcher, uh, a conservative politician who was active on, on climate change. Um, so what does this tell us about what's behind sort of falls in trust? I think the, the underlying social and economic trends are really important. You can't get away from that uh, rising inequality, a sense of stagnation outside metropolitan areas. Uh, I think Robert Putnam's written some really interesting stuff about, you know, people saying they expect to have poorer life opportunities than their parents and their children to have poorer life opportunities than them. I think that is very salient to this conversation. Um, but I think, as also Carol was, was indicating there in the discussion around Watergate, I think you also have these sort of focusing events. In the UK, we had a huge MPs expenses scandal in 2009. I don't know how much of this you, you picked up, but we had members of parliament claiming expenses for things like duck ponds and second homes and all sorts of things. Uh, we've also recently had a, a lobbying scandal um, so, you know, clearly you get these focusing events. Anne Applebaum's recent book, I think, was a very good explanation of how some of these specific events have, have influenced trust in different countries like Poland, Spain, the UK, and so on. Uh, clearly, specific leaders have a role uh, in, in trust. I think Brad was getting at that too. We've got a current prime minister in the UK who's repeatedly misled parliament, but with seemingly few conse consequences. Uh, it's hard to look at Germany's steady increase in trust over the last 20 years without reflecting on the role of Angela Merkel's leadership. Um, you also then have the role of parties. Um, I think Ezra Klein has written very well on this and the sort of feedback loops that you get between parties behaving in more polarised ways to appeal to voters who are themselves more polarised. Uh, we've seen a bit of that in the UK, uh, the sort of Conservative Party almost trying to import some of that culture war debate from the US. And it'll be interesting to see whether the voters actually shift in response to the parties behaving that way. Uh, and then finally, you've got this sort of question about digitalization and, and social media, which Brad discussed. The only thing I would add to that is I think that in an age of big data and, and leaks and sort of 24 hour scrutiny, it's almost <coughs> excuse me, impossible for bureaucracies to main tra maintain trust in the way they once did. So it's arguably a bit meaningless to compare trust in government now to in the 1980s or the 1950s, because it's a little bit of an unfair comparison. Um, just very briefly to finish up, I think why this matters, if you look at you know, climate change, COVID, all of these sort of big policy challenges, they're huge challenges that require governments to act decisively, uh, to spend large amounts of money, to get the public to pay for things, for, for investments, and to get the public to make changes in their lives, and all to respond to what are kind of quite abstract threats. Um, so on climate, which is a, a, the area I know best, uh, we in the UK are sort of a leader in some senses, but we've really done the easy bits so far, and that's decarbonising our energy sector. But when you're asking people to rip out boilers from their homes, to sort of change the very fabric of where they live, change their habits, change their diets, then I think, you know, trust in politicians is going to become 
an even more important thing. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but really interested to pick up more in the, in the discussion. Thanks, Tom. Um, our third panelist is fellow Canadian, Dr. Laurie Turnbull. Laurie is the director of the School of Public Administration and an associate professor of political science at Dalhousie University. From July 2015 until July 2017, Laurie was on secondment to the Privy Council Office, first as a policy advisor in the Machinery of Government Secretariat, and then as departmental liaison uh, to the Office of the Minister of Democratic Institutions, and finally as a policy advisor at the Priorities and Planning Secretariat. Dr. Turnbull's research and teaching focuses on parliamentary democracy and governance, public sector ethics, and democratic reform. Welcome, Laurie. Over to you. Thanks so much, Rhonda. And uh, thank you to everyone who's with us today. Thank you to my colleagues for setting up such an interesting panel. So I'm not going to take up a whole lot of time. I want to make sure that we have a lot of time for discussion and for questions and to be able to probe some of the things that we're all talking about, especially since we've got such a rich comparison uh, with that data behind it. It'll be really interesting to, to line up the things that we're talking about here with Brad's presentation from earlier this morning. So um, I am not going to come at you with statistics and things because that's not really what I do, but I'm going to lay out what I take to be a few truths about trust. Some of these things we've learned from our experiences with COVID-19. So I don't, my point is not to talk about trust during COVID so much, but it's more, what have we learned in over the past year, year and a half about how trust can change and what factors affect trust and why that stuff is important, why we need to know and why we need to be able to harness some of this knowledge to be able to build trust as we go forward. So truth number one, um, in the beginning of COVID-19, when everything first started, when we had our first lockdown, in, you know, over the course of the first few weeks, we saw levels of trust really go up. And even for politicians who normally do not enjoy high levels of trust, right? Like we saw trust kind of go up for everybody and for business too. And there are, few, there are potentially a few reasons for that. But I think one of them that we've been able to tease out at this point is that <clears throat> when there is a suppression of debate and you get more clear messaging and less fighting about what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what's the right idea, then you get higher levels of trust. And so this presents some interesting challenges for opposition parties, for instance, where I think when we saw the government come forward and try to you know, create a, a response, not only to the public health crisis, but also the economic crisis that was COVID-19, opposition parties for the most part fell in line and you know, pushed back on the government in what I would what I would say were responsible ways around not overdoing it with respect to how long the government could spend without coming back to parliament. Like I think the conservatives made good points around that, but essentially the opposition parties agreed to a financial aid package that would try to protect Canadians and protect businesses as much as we could. You didn't see a whole lot of opposition, um, you know, a lot of adversarialism, a lot of bickering that we're used to in Canada. We didn't see that so much for a while. And I, um, we also saw a kind of suppression of a lot of parliamentary activity in that parliamentary uh, processes moved to a hybrid model if they occurred at all. Uh, in my home province of Nova Scotia, Parliament didn't, the legislature didn't meet the whole time, not hybrid, not anything. And so I think it's interesting for us to think about what happens when the institutions that we rely on for accountability and hopefully, you know, account, there's a mechanism that there's, there's a relationship between the mechanism of parliamentary accountability and public trust. You know, that accountability process hopefully gives us reason to trust the system, but we see the kind of opposite where when we don't see that parliamentary activity going on, trust is actually higher. And the, you know, the prime minister is giving his briefings from his driveway as opposed to from the House of Commons. And he could have done that. You know, he could have given, he could, could have given that kind of feedback inside the house. There could have been a back and forth between the parties, but there wasn't, right? Like it, we moved to a very kind of press conference style of, of political communication. And for a while, um, the, the clear messaging, the, the lack of, of contra, you know, confrontation seemed to elevate levels of trust, at least for the time being. So that's point number one. Point number two, we're learning more about how misinformation affects trust. And I know Brad hit on that point a little while ago. Um, for a while, I would say we were having a hard time 
proving the effect of misinformation on trust and democracy and attitudes. It's hard to know how someone is, is even defining a mis misinformation in their own mind, whether someone sees something as misinformation, another person doesn't. Um, it's hard to know, and it's hard to know too, like people who consume misinformation, does that affect their voting behavior? Does that affect their attitudes toward politics and government? It's really, really hard to figure that out. And I think we need to find, you know, among all of us, some more innovative ways of measuring trust, but it's, we are starting to see now that there is a relationship between exposure to social media over a period of time and voting behavior, voter preferences, uh, sense of polarization, and overall trust, not only in government, but in each other. So it does matter, right? Like, and so the misinformation piece matters a lot, but I think, you know, that's something that we have to sort of build on a bit more to understand how we can do better on that. Because if, the, if we say to a government, okay, misinformation is a problem for democracy and for trust, and we have to fix that, how does the government handle that without, you know, being accused of censorship and getting too involved and, and doing the wrong thing? And so it's like, we can all assume that misinformation is bad, or we can agree that misinformation is bad. How to handle it is a really difficult thing. Uh, truth number three, um, a person's experience matters a lot when it comes to public trust. So sometimes we focus a lot on how government's actions affect trust. And, you know, even something like, um, you know, if there's a scandal in government or something like that, how does that affect how we feel about government overall? And I think we've got a lot of reasons to think that it's not so much that it's, it's you know, or at least it's only partly that a person's experience with government, um, what, you know, what kind of interactions you've had with government over time, what your financial situation is, uh, whether you feel a sense of hope, whether you think in five years time, you and your family are going to be better off. Those things affect public trust, not just in the government, but in each other, in businesses, in nonprofits. And so when we're looking at the trust piece, I think we have to look really broadly to think about what that person's scenario looks like. And we know that it really does matter, right? I mean, vaccine uptake is very much related to whether you trust government, whether you trust that the service is gonna be delivered properly, whether you feel that you can go to the government when you, when you need help, like it's, those sorts of things matter a lot. Um, truth number four is I would say there's a difference between trust in people and trust in institutions and processes. And this is something that we have to tease out, I think a little bit more, we have, and this is, this is something that I'd really be interested in the other panelists' um, views on. We have a kind of movement, I think, we've always had, had political brands. We've always had a sort of way of communicating in, a, in you know, simple messaging, emotional messaging, symbolism. That's always been a huge part of partisan politics. But I would say now we're moving even more down the road of political brands and people who are attracted to political office, and this is all you know, anecdotal off the top of my head, but things like, um, you know, when someone like Doug Ford, someone like Justin Trudeau, and I'm not saying they're the same at all, but people who had their own brands before they came to politics and they're coming to it with a sense of already having a, a public relationship with people and already having a style, already having a sense of values that might sometimes, you know, be, seem bigger than the office itself, that has a different, that, that has an effect on people. It, it's changing the way people identify with political office versus if you think of someone else who has been maybe not so much of a public figure. And so there's more of a focus on the office. And so I think that's sort of an area that's very intriguing to me and that I want to do future research on. But um, yeah, I don't want to take up any more time. So I think I'll leave it there, but thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Laurie, and thank you to all the panelists. You have inspired no shortage of questions for the next 45 minutes. Um, I'd like to start with a question, actually the question that Laurie said she'd like to hear the other panelists. So this is a question uh, from Laurie through me back to Carol and, and to Tom. Um, and so I'll just invite you both to comment on this idea that we increasingly see people come into public office with a pre with an already established brand. And, an, and a, a pre-existing relationship with um, like broader community. And, you know, what are your thoughts on that idea? Certainly that hasn't happened in the United States at all recently. So, <laughs> I mean, we are looking, I mean, in some ways the, the, this is the test in the United States that is this going to be the, 
you know, the Trump style, is this now the new normal? And, and you know, the, the Republican Party is, is right now grappling with uh, the, their Trumpist future and, and the degree to which uh, the former president himself will lead the party or his ideals. And, and, and when I say his ideals, they're less about policy and more about personal approach and, and, and style and, you know, that kind of philosophy. So I think that's a great question. I mean, as it relates to trust, I mean, one of the things that we were interested in here in the United States at the very beginning of the, of the coronavirus outbreak was, would there be that uh, rally around effect that we saw after the 9-11 attacks? Would there be kind of a moment of unification? We saw a little bit of it in the early months, but I have to say the, the, the Trump style, the Trump persona, the divisiveness of, of President Trump it, it attitudes quickly fell along partisan lines, as you might expect. And so in that sense, he, he himself served as the lightning rod. You still see this, to, to, to Laurie and Tom's point about when trust matters. In, in the United States, as you know, the vaccination campaign is going very well. But, you know, one thing I would like to study, the holdouts, the vaccine reluctance, their views of government, their views of, of, uh, of trust in government, what kind of correlation is there then, you know, because we have these hardcore holdouts in the United States who, are, who are prob may well prevent President Biden from getting his, his goal of 70% of adults vaccinated. So that's a lot of ideas I threw on the table, but I, would, I, I, I smiled when Laurie said the, the power of personality in politics because we've been living with it for five years. <laughs> Yeah, I just I, I think it's a really good question Laurie's put there. And of course, you can look here in the UK, we've got a, a, a prime minister in, in Boris Johnson, who's perhaps the sort of strongest example we've yet had of the sort of uh, media age politician. And I think, you know, there's a lot of discussion here of the sort of comparisons to Trump. I think they're quite off the mark in some ways, but there are some interesting, you know, in the sort of politics and, and what have you, but there's some interesting similarities in their ability to sort of capture attention and, and speak directly to voters. Um, I think we've also seen that on the, on the left in the UK and in, in, particularly in Jeremy Corbyn and the connection that he had with voters. I think the flip side of Laurie's question is really interesting too, actually, whether we are seeing uh, a fall in, in trust in institutions and processes, um, because you might have said that at some point, voters had a stronger connection to political parties rather than political leaders. Uh, and I think there's an interesting question here about the kind of de-alignment and actually the fact that voters all over the world, but particularly as we see it in the UK, don't seem to have any more a particularly strong connection to the Conservative Party or the Labour Party or whatever it is. So that's not necessarily when their trust, trust resides. But we can also look at other institutions, whether it's government itself, uh, the sort of voting system, the courts, so on and so forth. And we see lots of ways in which that trust is being strained. Um, so here in the UK, we're seeing you know, governments increasingly pushing at the boundaries of what is acceptable. Um, we, we have, as, as you may know, a sort of unwritten constitution uh, and a sort of a bit of a, we've actually got a popular theory in, in political uh, science here in the UK called the good chap theory of government, which basically goes that, you know, there's no written constitution, but you have, you know, people who are good chaps in government and they know how they're meant to behave. Well, that hasn't proved that robust to actually some of the things that politicians have wanted to do in the last two to three years, whether that's proroguing parliament over the, the sort of Brexit votes and things like that. So I think there's a really interesting question about how politicians sort of maintain trust in those institutions and processes, which have been the very basis of, of trust in sort of liberal democracy for a long time. Thank you both for that. Um, I, I wanna come back to this idea of trust in institutions, but first I'd like to pose all three of you a question that Carol raised in his remarks about um, in the US, a higher level of trust amongst local governments than amongst the national or federal level. Uh, and so I guess to, to Tom and to Lori, is that true in Canada and the UK as well, as we uh, heard from Carol that it happens in the US? And um, second question, why do you think that might be? Tom, would you like to go first? Sure, so I mean, I, I don't have the, the polling at my fingertips, but um, I would feel fairly confident that we'd see a similar pattern here in the UK where people do 
feel a stronger sense of trust in their, their sort of local government than they do in the national government. Um, the big difference I would I would draw is that in the UK, we're an extremely centralised uh, country. Uh, most of the sort of uh, policy making powers, tax and spend and things like that are held at the central government level. Um, I think people do feel a stronger connection to their local community. This is one of the things that we're looking at in climate change policy, where in the UK, like many other countries, we're trying to think about how we reach net zero, how we decarbonize our economy. And actually, the point at which people want to engage with that process is how can I shape how my local community feels and, and, and is for me? You know, that's what really animates them. They want to sort of talk about local buses. They want to talk about green spaces. They want to talk about, you know, what streets are like in their local area. Um, so I think there's very good reasons why people are more engaged and perhaps trust more at the local level. But I think there's also probably quite big differences based on how federalized countries are or not. But interested in, in Laurie's view from Canada. Yeah, I would say the same. I've like, I've seen studies over the years that have said, you know, people feel more attached and, and more, they identify more with their province than the feds. And there are studies that show municipal governments are trusted the most to deliver quality services. And there's lots of reasons for that. I mean, we know in Canada, we're, we're a big country ge geographically, and there's a high sense of identification with local community. Um, there's a sense that local governments know us better. They're more responsive. They're more kind of in line with the things that affect you every day. And so there's more of a kind of identification with, with the work that they do. Another thing that I wonder, um, and there's probably stuff that, that would answer this, there's probably information that would answer this question. I just don't have it on the top of my head right now, but um, there are no political parties at the municipal level in Canada. I mean, I know there's a couple of so, sort of exceptions to that where there's some municipalities that are working in the direction of slates and, and kind of informal parties, but for the most part, um, it is not a, a Westminster system. It is not a political party co uh, convention, you know, confidence convention kind of system. And so you don't see the same uh, incentives toward partisan competition and, and mudslinging and the rest of it. And so I, I think that has something to do with a sense that the government is there to do something for you rather than fight with each other. Uh, thanks for that, Lori. Um, so we didn't really talk about all the specific questions before today, but the extent to which Lori is kind of in my head um, will be demonstrated by the next question. Because certainly in Canada, as Lori said, most of our municipalities are not, you know, the individuals elected are not political. And what we see also in a number of big cities is that the, the amount of time devoted to election campaigning is much shorter than at the provincial or federal level. So my next question is, you know, to what extent do you think the political cycle, so um, the four-year mandate, uh, hinders the ability to build trust because there is so much time taken away from what we might perceive to be the work of government towards campaigning. Any thoughts on that from your respective jurisdictions? Uh, perhaps, Carol, would you like to go first? Well, I, in the United States, the, certainly the, the first thing that comes to mind is the two-year cycle for the House of Representatives and, and the, those members, especially members in competitive districts who really feel the pressure to start fundraising and, and campaigning almost as soon as they are elected. I mean, that, that's, that's certainly clear. Um, you know, it's, it, it, is, it, is, it does make things uh, more intensely political. It, it definitely does that kind of, and, and you know, they, certainly the, the, what I would call in national politics, the, the media emphasis on elections and the so-called political horse race uh, probably intensifies things as well. We're already talking about, uh, you know, who's who's running in 2024. Will Kamala Harris? Will Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida? I mean, the me not criticizing my friends in the media, but that sort of speculation just sort of amps up that kind of pressure. Yeah, I, th I think we see something similar here in the UK. I mean, we have ostensibly a sort of five-year election cycle through the sort of Fixed-Term Parliaments Act. Um, and certainly you see sort of heightened polarisation sort of around election time, but also sort of a, a distraction away from maybe the work of government and focusing on some of those policy issues. It's one of the, the difficulties we often talk about with very long-term policy problems, whether that's climate change, social care, so on and so forth. 
uh, is that there aren't particularly strong incentives actually for, for politicians to work on some of those problems that are going to take 20 to 30 years to fix, because uh, actually their incentives are much more short term. And if you even look at their incentives within their career, they might be moving from one ministry to another every one or two years. So I think that's quite a difficult gap between you know, some of the uh, incentives on politicians and some of the outcomes that might be needed to build trust. Um, but I just wanted to pick up actually a comment from, from Catherine in the chat as well, I think, which is a really important one about increasing tensions within the UK government system. Uh, we've got a, a sort of devolved set of governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and we're seeing very strongly sort of increased tensions between those different parts of government. So I think that's a really good point about actually how you maintain in a, in a sort of semi-federal structure that we have uh, different parts, you know, trust, trust from different parts of that state in the central government. Actually, trust in the, in, in the UK government is very low in, in, in parts of Scotland. I'll just try to be quick on this, Rhonda, that we have um, election speculation in Canada because we have a minority parliament and it's not quite two years old, but it would be in October if it makes it that long. And um, I think a sense on the part of the liberal government that they, if they can turn this minority into a majority, then they're going to do it. And of course, that all depends on the vaccine rollout. And I think if he gets to a point in the midsummer where he's got 70% of the people with their first shot and a good rollout on the second shot, then he'll probably go for it. And I think that type of thing sometimes, like he's got to play that very carefully, he being the prime minister, of course, um, because people don't want an unnecessarily election. Sometimes that can backfire. Um, probably his worst case scenario is he comes back with a minority that he has now and perhaps a slightly more hostile opposition. But it's interesting to me, I'm not sure what the effect on public trust is, but it's going back to the comments about um, people's relationships with political parties versus leaders. We have a very fractured political party system in Canada. I feel that we have too many political parties. There's too many people, like there's quite a bit of consensus if you look at um, the Liberals roadmap and the NDP and even the Greens, even the Bloc Québécois. And the Conservatives are right now parked right around their base. And this leader doesn't seem to be able to grow that beyond that base very much. And we'll see if he's able to do that in the next election. But I think what we're going to have is two very different conceptions of how are we going to build back post-COVID. And a lot of agreement on the left, you know, center left side among the parties, even though there are, you know, arguably four parties with parliamentary representation on that side. And so I'm not sure going forward how this is going to play out. And if the Liberals are able to turn it into majority, I think it's going to be because they're appealing more broadly in Quebec. They're appealing more broadly among rural voters, which they lost quite a bit of support from in the last round. And so I'm, I'm sort of thinking, like, how are the different constituencies going to be represented going forward, especially um, if we do have a kind of, I think, an election that's not going to be a referendum on the government. It's going to be a referendum on what, what kind of approach do you want to take to rebuilding? Yeah, good point. Good points, everyone. Thank you for that. Um, sticking with this idea of brand, we have a question from Slido uh, and the individual asks, at what point will uh, brand, party brand, run up against, you know, competence or lack thereof for government to deliver services? Who would like to go first? Happy to come in on, on that. Um, I mean, I think this is certainly something we've been talking about at the UK and as a, this, a sort of extent of organizations like my one sort of doing a bit of hand wringing in the sense of, you know, we, we spend a lot of time scrutinizing the performance of government and the outcomes that government might produce. And we look at sort of education attainment or, you know, hospital waiting times or whatever it is. And then sometimes you sort of come around to another election. It doesn't seem like any of those metrics have improved and the government proves to be resoundingly popular. So there's almost like a gap between actually you know, what you might think of as the outcomes which might drive people's, you know, well-being and things like that, and actually the sort of popularity that certain politicians have. And this comes back to our discussion of, you know, in a sense where they get their legitimacy from, if they're very effective at using the media to provide signals and messages that people like, how much does it, how much does competence really matter um, in, in those cases? I think that's a really um, interesting question for, 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 you know, democracies to, to run against, because, you um, it, it may be the case that, you know, you need to find ways of making arguments about the need to focus on outcomes um, that sort of get around some of those sort of personality type, type politics. It's a, it's a fascinating issue in the United States as well. I was thinking about, um, you know, when we, when you look back in early 2020 and um, 
the expectation at that time was because of the reasonably strong economy that Trump would probably be favored for re-election, say in January 2020, with, with, with economic views as positive as they had been in, in two decades. And so in that sense, the big picture in the sense that, you know, the degree to which a president can influence, uh, you know, the, the trajectory of the economy, of course, is debatable, but, you know, he, he was about to take credit. And then you see the coronavirus. And of course, uh, that became the dominant issue. So in some sense, these, these performance issues still matter. But the fact is that in the United States, 90% of Republicans vote for the Republican candidate and 90% of Democrats vote for the Democratic candidate. And, and the, the, the basis for that partisanship, this partisanship increasingly is not necessarily a positive view of their own party, but a negative view and a fear of the opposing party. And that seems to be what, what's driving American politics right now. And it, and, it, and it certainly is associated with Trump and his tactics, but, but I think it goes a lot deeper than that. I was, I was listening to everything you were saying and then I was like, oh, right, I'm supposed to say something. So yeah, it's, I'm really, really fascinated by this question. And I think the, the brand issue is playing out in different ways, depending on who the politician is you're talking about. But it does seem that there's, a, there's an increasing um, prominence of, of this brand that may be attached to a single individual. And so brand and this is i guess neither here nor there is never seems to be based on competence it's always based on identity virtues um you know what whatever one's vision is for the, for the country or how you, what your style is um you know that sort of thing right and so it's it's interesting when you think about it from a trust perspective because where would you build your trust in a brand you know, especially when you're not talking about a corporate brand that repeats a product over and over again, and then you trust the brand because you trust the product because you like your experience and it makes your life better. How does that apply to politics, right? Like when you're, the brand is a person who is actually very far away from you. And in Canada, we don't get to vote directly for the brand, right? Like not very many people go to, are going to go to election in 2022 and put Doug Ford. That's only the people in his riding, right? Like, so we don't even get to directly choose the brand. And so it's a really strange exercise for me. Now, on the other side of it, from the deli service delivery perspective, because we have, you know, an objective, nonpartisan, neutral, evidence-based public service, there should be continuity to the delivery of services across governments, and we shouldn't feel a seismic shift when the political side changes hands. However, obviously, um, the public service is doing, doing the work and carrying out the mandate of the elected government, and so we can see, you know, we can certainly experience differences in priorities of governments over time when... Uh, the public service is doing its job. And as much as Laurie said, we don't vote for brand, we do vote for political parties that have platforms. And, and we've seen certainly in Canada, the last few elections that, you know, certain issues have become the forefront or seminal to those platforms, whether it's climate change or energy or, you know, all sorts of other things. And then of course, you know, depending on who's elected, we see programs, incentives cut or built or added. And so there is, I would like to infer, there is a sense of that brand informing, but it's really the platform. So there's a question in Slido, which I think is really relevant to this portion of the conversation, which asks, you know, would it, it, would it be effective for political parties to build trust issue by issue? So to build trust around climate change or around energy or around healthcare services? Uh, thoughts on that and, and who would like to take that one on first? I'm happy, happy to have a, a first stab at it. Um, so, I mean, I, mean th I think it's an interesting question because the other point that it connects to is the role that manifestos play, right? Because, you know, in a sense, the manifestos, which sort of set out, you know, an entire party's program of commitments on policy, are meant to sort of ha be that link between the voter trusting that if they vote for this party standing on this manifesto, they will deliver that policy. Now, I mean, we've seen uh, some, some interesting things happen with that in the UK over recent years where, you know, initially we had our, our sort of first coalition government in 2010 and then sort of a whole load of policies that each party that came together in that coalition didn't actually sort of happen in the end. So that was a sort of bit of a, a, a sort of surprising thing for some of those voters. 
Um, but I think what we've also seen is actually perhaps manifestos becoming more of an exercise in signaling values and sort of signalizing what a party is about and less of a very rigid policy program for what that government might achieve. Um, the Conservative Party won the most recent election on a very brief sort of short manifesto um, and has gone on to do some things that, you know, sort of didn't, didn't really talk about particularly very much. Um, I think perhaps in other countries uh, than the UK, probably to do with their electoral systems, you've seen more of an emergence of parties set up to sort of stand on single issues. You know, so we're seeing, uh, I mean, the Green Party in Germany obviously has become a very different type of beast and has, you know, a, a very broad policy agenda, but sort of started from those roots sort of working on environmental issues. Um, and I think, you know, increasingly, probably a party is going to, people are going to look at parties and, and, and ask what sort of competence they have on issues like healthcare, social care, climate, if, you, if you're a younger voter and so on. Um, but it depends probably quite a bit on the electoral system you're looking at. Go ahead, Laurie. Okay, that's a really interesting question. And I've thought of that myself, right? Like how should they organize is, and I think they probably, as, as um, Tom had said, like I think parties do over time become identified with certain issues other parties become identified with other issues and they do have a way of differentiating themselves. But if you take an example like the Green Party and they were, I think they were really facing an interesting challenge in the 2019 election in Canada because the Green Party in, in a number of provinces has had much higher levels of success than they have historically over the past few uh, like rounds of provincial elections. And there was some pressure, I think, on the federal Greens to produce a kind of improved result like the provincial uh, Green parties had. And they didn't do that. And in 2019, this everybody was talking about this as a climate change election, right? Like, and there were, you know, Andrew Scheer, the leader of the Conservatives at the time, got in a bunch of trouble because he wouldn't acknowledge, you know, that what was going on in terms of climate change. He wouldn't attend the, the protests and he was sort of an outlier that way. And what ended up happening was that the Greens really didn't do any better at all. I think what might be happening is that they are building the trust. They're building the trust around an issue like environment, but Canadians are strategic voters. And so they're priming the issue. They're getting everybody all interested, you know, like they're doing a lot of the work and getting people to understand this is a pivotal thing. We really have to take it seriously. And so then the strategic voter looks around the platforms and says, well, who's, who's going to like, who has a decent platform on the environment that might actually win? I'll vote for them. And so I think we've got that side of it too, right? Like it's not a straight linear, I'm going to vote for the party that I think is best on the issue I care about. It's that, but it's also looking around to see what who what I think other voters are going to do, and I don't want to waste my vote. Well, in the U.S., again, you have this sort of two this this polarized system where I think party party labels, party brands matter more than 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 the policy issues themselves to some degree. I think there is a penalty for uh, say a Republican, you know, leader, elected official for for. Uh, you know, kind of descending from a key position on, you know, say the, the, the party stance on abortion. But what really matters in the, in the Republican Party today, obviously, is loyalty to one person, as we've seen over the past several months. It, it matters more than any single policy issue. You see the number three person in the House of Representatives who's taken moderate positions on many, this is at least Stefanik from New York, who replaced Liz Cheney on that one single issue. Now, I don't want to overwrite that going forward, but but the Republican Party has has become this, this, uh, this sort of Trumpian place. I think what's, what's interesting is, again, there are some core positions there. And I think among Democrats as well, you know, Policy really does matter, but I think in, in this polarized environment, the Trump impact on the Republican Party, I think, is just we're, we're, we're going to be reckoning with that for years to come. OK, um, a quick service announcement before we move to our next question. Uh, I've been asked to wrap us up at, at 11.35, so in 10 minutes instead of at 11.45. I think we've got time for two more questions. Um, so we've talked a lot, I think very interestingly around brand and policy issues. I'd like to, um, and we talked a bit about the public service, I'd like to now take us uh, in a bit of a different direction and ask a question um, about the role of corporate interests. So to all the panelists, 
you know, can you comment on the perception that corporate interests govern the priorities of governments and the and what are the implications of this on public trust in government? I think that you can see, I mean, one of the, the things that Republicans and Democrats can agree on is, is, the, is, is their uh, belief that sort of corporate interests dictate too much uh, of, of US policy and, and US politics. That's, that's not gotten a lot of attention on either side because these same parties are sort of reliant on these, these corporate interests. And, to get, and unless you're Elizabeth Warren or some other politicians, you're not gonna to go too hard against them. But, but it has been a factor. We, we once overlaid the line of trust in government with the big, with, a, with another old polling question, do big interests in the United States, do big corporate interests uh, as a special interest control too much? And it's almost, a, a, you know, an overlap of, of those two lines since the 1970s. So there, so there is, is something there, the belief that, that the fix is in the corporate the corporations have, have too much power and too much influence over politics. I think there's probably always going to be some of that because it's a reflection of what people know about power, right? Like people understand that uh, when there is a concentration of power among people who, and groups and corporations that have resources and, and you know, there, it's hard to not have that suspicion, you know, at some point. And I think um, there are ways in which all, I think all jurisdictions and definitely Canada try to diminish that you know, and even, for example, like something that's in, in the news yesterday and today, our campaign finance rules, we try to give the public assurances that, you know, there's no opportunity here for undue influence and undue access and things like that. But at the same time, it's deeper than that. And I, but at the same time, there are, there are counter examples too. Like if you see how the debate has gone in this country with respect to pipelines, um, there's been a lot of pushback on, you know, to the point that, you um, that there's concern in the business community about the ability to be able to get a project through in Canada. And so I think it's a complex, it's getting more complex for sure. Yeah, I completely agree with, with Laurie that is, you know, this is a, this is just an issue of politics really in terms of, you know, we have large players in our economy and they will seek to influence the, the political process. That's normal. Um, I suppose the interesting question for me is what effect it has when you have these particular scandals where, where particular bits of lobbying are exposed. Uh, we've just had one in the UK. So our former Prime Minister, David Cameron, was revealed to be sort of texting a lot of his former colleagues, trying to influence some of the coronavirus emergency spending. Interestingly, we also had civil servants caught up in that scandal in the UK for revealed to sort of have uh, be holding jobs in the private sector at the time that they were meant to be in government working and advising uh, ministers. So there's an interesting sort of media dynamic in the sense of which once these lobbying scandals get opened up, it's sort of open season and anyone who's got an ax to grind against a former politician, a civil servant, whatever it is, um, can do that. And just to, to link up with what Carol said, I think there is an interesting sense in which actually this no longer fits neatly on left right borders in the sense of, you know, maybe 10 years ago in the UK, we would have seen the Conservatives as a pro business party, a little bit less wanting to talk about lobbying and things like that. And, and sort of the left wing parties as, as more sort of concerned with that. What's quite interesting now is that actually leaders like Boris Johnson have proved themselves quite willing to take on corporate interests as a sort of signal that they're on the side of the voter. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's a few interesting dynamics going on there. Thank you all for that. That was really interesting. Um, uh, Tom, you reminded me that a point Carol made in, in his introductory remarks around Watergate being, um, my word is, you know, a tipping point in the decline of trust in the U.S. and and um, and that comment sort of reinforced for me something that we see increasingly in Canada, which is like this notion of gate has taken on meme culture. Every political misstep in Canada becomes a gate of some kind. And um, you know, and and uh, I had the privilege of, of teaching a, a class at um, University of Ottawa this past semester, and students are using this word, and they have no idea what Watergate was but they know that a gate is like not on, you know, someone's made a mistake if they're being accused of a gate. Uh, anyway, sorry, that's my, that's my side note. So I think we've got time for one question and, um, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take us back to our opening keynote this morning was uh, Toma uh, Granjuan, uh, fascinating keynote presentation. And, um, and so thinking globally, I'll, you know, uh, and how 
governments can work together. Tomas suggested that one reason we have not yet found a political solution for disinformation um, you know, globally is really a sense of uh, potentially conflicting cultural drivers that you know, in the EU and in Canada, we really love our, our privacy, um, but the US has this like visceral defense of the First Amendment. So my question to you is, does anyone want to take, take a stab at, you know, what could international political ground be on fighting disinformation as a means to build trust in government? It's a big question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll try and start and then uh, I'm sure Laurie and, and Carol will be able to sort of come in with uh, more fully formed Thoughts. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the interesting things for me looking at this from the UK, so I think the question is absolutely right that one of the things we're struggling with is that we have quite different expectations and political cultures. You see that in the way Germany responds to some of these big US tech companies, right? Um, I think one of the really interesting things for me is looking at the rules that govern that. So the fact that you now have a sort of, you know, the oversight board of Facebook made up of sort of former Scandinavian prime ministers and you have our, our former deputy prime minister sort of as Facebook's global space, the spokesman coming out to announce on when Trump will be you know, allowed back onto their platforms. I mean, it's a really fascinating time to be thinking about who's policing, who gets to speak to the public in terms of politi politicians. Um, I think probably there is a need for um, a sort of set of rules which countries around the world can agree on. It seems to me the fact that a lot of these decisions are made in quite an opaque fashion in boardrooms in California is suboptimal for sort of building trust in some of these political processes, but really interested in what Carol and, and Laurie think. Well, I would just say that the United States is having so much trouble and division in, <laughs> in addressing this issue. It will be a while before the United States can effectively coordinate with, with other nations. Uh, you know, it is, it is a very tough issue. Uh, for the United States, even even identifying what misinformation is uh, first and foremost, but I would say that that there's there there may be more common ground in 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 efforts to rein in the tech companies themselves. I think that that may be a potential area where there, there might be some more common ground than than kind of global rules on misinformation. I think that com countries really need to work together on this and to share information because it's it's hard right like this is just difficult from even like a, a knowledge perspective to get a handle like it on on this content itself and i think because of of the power of um and this is really getting to poli sci 101 here just the power of the non-state actors that we're talking about and the the difficulty that states are having in putting any regulation on it i think it's, it's helpful if we share knowledge and maybe build together some sort of legitimacy around regulation in the first place and what that can look like. Like, for example, Canada tried um, to amend the Elections Act so as to prohibit false statements aimed at candidates during campaigns. And it was struck down. And I know why it was struck down. But it's, it's again, like, why how can we actually do the thing that we, we all want to do, right? Like it's hard to actually get the wiring right. And so that's where I think it would be good for some sharing of best practices or lessons learned or times where things totally flopped. And that way governments can sort of work together on a legitimate way of being able to get into that space. Because it's, it's as soon as you start talking about, you know, people worry about censorship, we're having that debate now in Canada with C10. So it's, it's really, really, really difficult. It's going to take time, I think. And I think that's a great note to close on. So much of you know building trust and building understanding and fighting disinformation or misinformation does take time. Um, whether we have that time in a political cycle or not is, is another question. So um, we are now at the end of our allotted time. Please join me with your emojis and reactions uh, or you know on silent your, your hands and give our panelists a big fat juicy uh, thanks for their presentations and their interventions. Um, and again, we're going to move to an interactive portion now for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. If you're on YouTube and you want to join us, please click on that link that takes you to our Slack chat. For folks in the Zoom room, you can just stay put and um, Gafar and Catherine will take over in just a second. Uh, but we are postponed, or we are now pausing the YouTube live feed.